Okay, let me start. Hmm. I'm start, oh yes. Tick. So, hello guys, welcome to today's session. So, I am Dr. Alekia, Faculty for Orthopedics. Today, we are going to do a holistic approach for orthopedics. So, I am going to cover almost entire topic for your upcoming NEET PG. So, let's start today's class. So, before that, I have a small announcement for you all. So, PW, that is Physics Wala Med Ed, is going to start a grand test series for all the upcoming aspirants. So tomorrow there is a grand test live happening at 10 a.m. There is a link given in our box, given in the description below the video. So for the details, you can please click the link and do attend the grand test. It is a great use for all the UG attending, uh, all the people who are attending for the exam, right? So let's start the orthopedics today. So, I am starting today's session with very important and the first question relating to the hip joint. So, let us read the question. So, this is a question regarding a male patient of 35 years who are presented to the emergency department with the history of a road traffic accident. And as arriving to the department, he was unconscious and presented with an attitude of a limb which gave a clue for ordering a pelvis with both x-rays. Like pelvis with both hips, x-rays. X-ray is as shown. What would be what would have been the attitude of the limb for such an x-ray? So I'm just zooming the x-ray for you. So if you somebody can read the x-ray. So this is a x-ray which is showing the dislocation, right? So it is dislocation of hip joint. Because you can see there, this is normal limb, this is normal limb and this is, there is some abnormality which is happening here. So, this is abnormal limb. So, here this is the abnormal limb. So, what is abnormality here which you can see? So, there is the acetabulum and this is the femoral head. So, there is no congruency of the femoral head and acetabulum. So, this is called the dislocation so the articulating surfaces have been disengaged so what type of dislocation is this this is posterior dislocation of hip right yeah many of you have answered it correct it is posterior dislocation of hip so when a person is presenting with posterior dislocation what would be his attitude of limb so it is so on the x-ray itself you can see there is adduction so the limb here it is towards the midline so this is adduction and now this based this external rotation and internal rotation of the limb can be assessed based upon your presence of the lesser trochanter right so if your lesser trochanter is seen clearly on the x-ray it means that the limb is externally rotated if your lesser trochanter that is your lt is not visible on the x-ray then the limb is internally rotated so the answer for this is 
adduction, internal rotation and flexion. So, answer is C. Flexion, adduction and internal rotation. So, this is how we come to a conclusion for the answer. So, let us now understand what is posterior dislocation of hip in little bit detail. So, before that I want to just explain you few important, few important points which you need to be known on the x-ray. So, for an orthopedic surgeon reading the pelvis with both hips x-ray is very important. Right. So, we will start reading this x-ray. So, first you have to comment on the bones. So, there are various bones which you can see. So, this is your iliac bone and this is your pubis. And here it is your ischium. So, this is your pelvis and then. So, let me write pubis here. So, this is your pubic symphysis. Right. And then this is your acetabular. The dome of acetabulum. And then this is your femoral head. Right. And here you can see there are various trabeculae or various striations which are present. These are the lines which are present on the femoral head. So, based upon this you can comment that whether this limb is osteoporotic or not. Right. And then this is your greater trochanter GT and this is your lesser trochanter LT. So, now if you see this is your lesser trochanter. If the lesser trochanter is normally visible, like it is not more prominent or less prominent. If it is more prominent, that means the limb is in external rotation. If it is less prominent, that means it is in internal rotation. What is the reason for this? The reason for this is the lesser trochanter is situated posterior medially of the femur bone. So, when it is internally rotated, it is going more posteriorly. So, you can't see it on the AP X-ray. So, that is how you can come to a diagnosis as internal rotation of this particular case. Right? And then you have to comment upon the Shenton's line. So, what is Shenton's line? A line which is drawn along the obturator foramen towards the shaft of the femur on the medial aspect of shaft of the femur. So, this is your Shenton's line. So, this is your Shenton's line. Right? So, any break of this Shenton's line is indicative of fracture. Right? So, there will be Shenton's line which you have to comment. Right, and then this is the obturator foramen here, and these are various lines. So, ilio pectineal line, then your ilio ischial line. So, these lines are important to comment upon the acetabulum fractures. So, these are the various things you see here. So, this is your sacroiliac joint, SI joint. So, these are some of the important landmarks which you can comment on the x-ray, right? And then let us learn in detail about the posterior dislocation of hip. So, posterior dislocation of hip is the most common dislocation of hip joint and it is usually associated with a very high velocity injuries right so the reason for this is so posterior uh, the, this hip joint whatever the hip joint is a ball and socket joint which is formed by the femoral head and the acetabulum now this hip joint is protected by various ligament and various muscular muscles which are present around it and because of the because of this various ligaments and muscles it requires a very huge force to get dislocated so that is why this is always been associated with the high velocity injury right and then this Posterior dislocation is always an emergency. So, why it is emergency? Because this dislocation will result in disruption. Disruption of the blood supply. 
So we all know the blood supply is from the femoral artery to profunda femoris artery and then to the vessels that is the retinacular vessels which are surrounding around the hip joint, right? So these vessels get de gets disrupted during the dislocation and if it is not secured immediately, this will result in a condition called ischemia ultimately leading to necrosis. So that is nothing but your AVN, avascular necrosis of femoral head. So to prevent such a dreadful complication, you have to do this as an emergency condition. You have to redu reduce the dislocation. So this reduction can be done in the ER room itself or it can be done under anesthesia. So always a trial of closed reduction is done. Right? And then if there is an associated fractures or if the joint is unstable after reduction, you go for a open reduction. That is you open the joint and then you reduce and fix it. Right. So this is about your posterior dislocation of hip. So most common dislocation of the hip joint is most common dislocation is your posterior dislocation. This is contrary to your shoulder joint. Shoulder joint is mostly unstable. So the shoulder joint is anteriorly dislocated. So most common dislocation in the shoulder is anterior dislocation but in hip it is posterior dislocation. Having understood that I even want to explain in further detail about various dashboard injuries. So this hip dislocation is component of a dashboard injury right so what is this dashboard injury so if a person is traveling in a car and he's in the driver's seat with his hip in 90 90 degrees flexion and knee in 90 degrees flexion so the forces, whenever there is an RTA, the force directly acts on his hip and knee joint, which is in this 90 degrees position. So <clears throat> the fracture pattern always depends upon the position or your attitude of limb during the injury. So if the hip and knee are in 90 degrees, when this gets uh, injured during this placement of uh, hip and knee, this will result in posterior dislocation. A simple posterior dislocation but if this is not in 90 degrees it is less than 90 somewhere around 60 or 70 degrees this will result in fracture dislocation right so what are these fractures which are happening around so it could be a acetabulum fracture or it could be a pelvic fracture or it could be a femur shaft fracture right so these are the associated injuries which you have to look when a patient is presenting you with a posterior dislocation. And the knee is also injured here. So dashboard gets, at, uh, in, a, in case of a dashboard injury, your knee also gets injured with a direct force. So hence, there would be a patella fracture which is usually comminuted because of the direct force which is acting on patella and there could be a PCL disruption that is your posterior cruciate ligament disruption. So these are the complex of dashboard injuries. So answering this, the father is a basic question. So this is usually a easy question, right? So what is the attitude of limb? Usually you learn this, but the extension of the topic, the posterior dislocation. So you should look for further. So it is an further, furtherly you have to look for your patella, you have to look for your knee joint, you have to look for the PCL injury. These are all the extension of the posterior dislocation. So any patient who comes with the posterior dislocation should be assessed as following. So first you have to assess the general condition because in, in, in addition to dislocation, he might have a pelvic fracture or a femur shaft fracture which will result in hypovolemic shock. So that shock should be treated and then the person should be further evaluated one joint above and one joint below. So one joint below is your knee joint. So you, are, you have to put it in mind that there would be a patella or a PCL disruption in association with your posterior dislocation of hip. Right. And then comes your anterior dislocation. So here it is Faber. Right. Subhashini, you will get the PDF in the telegram. So after the end of the class, we'll upload this PDF in the telegram. So you will get there, right? 
okay now next we are dealing about the anterior dislocation so this is exactly opposite to the posterior dislocation so this will result in flexion abduction and external rotation where this femoral head is coming outside anteriorly so what is the important ligament which is present on the anterior aspect of the hip joint one of the strongest ligament yeah faber father is done now tell me what is the important ligament which is present on the anterior aspect of the hip joint i'm waiting for your answer so it is the ilio femoral ligament right yeah very good it is ligament of also called as ligament of biglow it is what is the shape of this it is in shape of y so it has two limbs so this is one of the strongest ligament of the body ligament of biglow or uh, uh, iliofemoral ligament which is present over the anterior aspect hence this anterior dislocations are not very common the posterior dislocations are very common in case of hip joint so and then this is the attitude of the limb so this is as you can see it is flexion abduction and external rotation so now if you have followed my class now you can see the lesser trochanter is more prominent so this is in external rotation right and the head is bigger in size in case of anterior dislocation head size appears to be bigger and in case of posterior dislocation the head size appears to be smaller right so this is also an emergency and it needs reduction now next is your what is this fracture this is one more type of post this is one more type of dislocation can somebody tell me what type of dislocation is this so this posterior dislocation has been recently asked in neat pg so this is one of your pyqs so very good somebody has answered sagar it is central dislocation so what is the peculiar feature of central dislocation sagar if you can answer it is always associated with fracture so there will be a break in the acetabulum which will allow the which will allow the femoral head to enter into pelvis yes through the femoral head through the medial wall of the acetabulum entering into the pelvis is the central dislocation so in in posterior dislocation you can find this femoral head on your posterior aspect on anterior dislocation you can find this femoral head on your anterior aspect in central dislocation what is that examination you do to find the head i mean where do you feel the head so it is not present anteriorly it is not present posteriorly so where it is present so for this very good so you have to do a per rectal examination to find out the swelling the, the, the bony swelling on per rectal examination is indication of a central dislocation right this is an emergency and this requires a surgical fixation because acetabulum to be reconstructed again and it is then reduced and then maintained into that acetabulum so this completes the dislocation of hip joint so there we, we have dealt about the posterior the anterior and the central dislocation right now coming to the next topic so i'm going to read the question for you identify the type of fixation shown in the image this type of fixation is used for all the below mentioned conditions except so i'm waiting for your answers so what is this type of fixation
so this is a form of external fixation right so whenever there is a fracture so whenever there is a fracture fracture so this is the fracture so how to deal with certain fractures so this fracture should be fixed right so what are the various methods where you can fix a fracture so these fractures can be further divided into open fractures and closed fractures so for open fractures because there is a tendency for it to get infected we go with external fixation so for open type of fracture where there is a compromise for soft tissue compromise of soft tissue covering you go for a external fixation right you go for a external fixation example your tibia bone so whenever there is a compound injury or open injury over the tibia because the tibia is supposed to be the most cutaneous bone and usually in tibia we go for external fixation if there is a compound injury in case of closed in case of closed fractures you can go for internal fixation right so this is the basis for your external fixation which is fixa fixing the fracture from the outside and internal fixation fixing the fracture inside onto the bone directly right so this type of external fixation is of two types again right external fixation is of two types so one is your tube or rod rod type of fixation and second one is your ring type of fixation right so what is the difference between rod and the ring type so if you see an image which i have displayed here and this is one of the x-ray it is from our own hospital which we have operated so this is your tube or rod type of fixation right and here you will have rods and shans pins these are called connecting rods and then you will have clamps so this is your external fixator system so now you will put this shans pin so you have so here if you can identify this is the fracture so this is the fracture and this was an open injury where internal fixation was not recommended because open injuries the soft tissue which is present over the bone is lost so once the implant is placed it should be covered by a soft tissue covering so that the implant doesn't get infected right and so for this we have gone for external fixation so how do you fix it with the external fixation these are called the shan spins so if you see if you can clearly observe there is some threaded portion right threaded portion so these threaded portions are imbibed into the bone here so there are two rod two two pins above the fracture and below the fracture which will stabilize the fracture and from the outside these are connected to the connecting rods so these are the clamps this is the shan pins and these are your rods right this is how your external system works so now the fracture is stable and we are making the fracture to heal by this stability and coming to ring type of fixation so coming to ring type of fixation this was first discovered by a russian scientist named ilizarov right and it works on the principle called distraction osteogenesis right the term is distraction osteogenesis so what do you mean by distraction and osteogenesis osteogenesis is nothing but formation of the bone so osteogenesis osteobone genesis is formation so bone formation is done by distracting and compressing this fracture under biological control that means the amount which is been distracted or compressed is controlled it is not this uh, so much amount of uh, uh, so much so whatever amount you want you can't give it there you have to distract it accordingly under biological control hence this will cause bone healing right 
so that is the basis for Elizara. This is done 360 degrees that is full circle fixation so hence it is called a ring fixation and it is done by a small olive wires which are passed circumferentially and connected by the rings and here the important point is patient can weight bear after fixation patient can weight bear weight bearing is allowed soft tissue healing is allowed right so infection is controlled so these are various benefits of this elizara fixation but it is cumbersome for the patient not so patient complain not so patient acceptable so usually this is done for so hence it has some disadvantages to it it is used only for certain conditions so what are those conditions so conditions in which it is used is it is mainly used in limb lengthening it it is it has got its popularity in limb lengthening procedure so elizarab is mainly used for limb lengthening procedures and in case of non union so what is non union when the bone is not healing so every bone has certain period of time so for the femur neck it is 3 months for tbi it is 6 months likewise if the bone is still not showing any signs of union after the stipulated time and if it requires any additional support from the outside so it requires any additional support from the outside then this condition is called as non union so what is delayed union delayed union is where the bone is taking more time than the stipulated time but it might and might not require any additional support from outside right so but non-union requires support like bone grafting or exchange of the implants so it requires some amount of inter interruption of the healing right so that is non-union yeah i meant shan spins right yes steam and pin is different and shan spins are different steam and pins are used for your skeletal tractions shan spins are used for your external fixations right so they both are different so there are various procedures where the uh, ring fixation is used in limb lengthening procedures and then it is non-union and and it is also used in deformity corrections so few congenital deformities like pseudoarthrosis of tibia or uh, uh, arthrogyropsis where people where the uh, child presents with deformity this elizara technique can be used for correcting those deformities and one more important thing it is used in chronic osteomyelitis so as i've already told you it helps in healing so it helps in even in the infected conditions you can put elizara because it is outside the bone right so it is used in chronic osteomyelitis so after hearing that all the details about the external fixation i hope you can answer this question without any further delay so it is acute osteomyelitis right so this is the answer so in acute osteomyelitis you usually don't do i know answering this question is simple because acute osteomyelitis if somebody has read about it you will definitely answer but the reason why it is not used is also important so that is how you will prepare for your uh, exam so the question is important the concept behind it is also important for answering further questions from the same topic so that completes your external fixation right any doubts regarding the external fixation uh, n wenki the answer is not all the above it is acute osteomyelitis you have to read the answer uh, read the options once again so any doubts regarding this external fixation please uh, uh, you can comment here in the chat box if you have any doubts regarding this let me answer them ha huh, so what is mal union you want to know what is mal union so i have told you non union is where the bone does not heal delayed union is where the bone heals but it does not uh, require any additional support right then mal union what is mal union the union occurs but it is not in the alignment in which we likes it might get a deformed alignment so that is mal united right 
it is in mal alignment which is where the union is occurring like your for example if you have this colis fracture if it is not treated then it will result in your dinner fork deformity so that is mal union right yeah very good so i have i am seeing some answers in the comment very good Ah, so as uh, you are all well versed with the pathology, I know Dr. Ranjit has taken good care of your pathology. So I know this is the uh, Jain cells, right? Multinuclear Jain cells, which are seen here, right? So hence it is a tumor, Jain cell tumor. Very good. So, having understood that it is a Jain cell tumor, now let's answer this. So, Jain cell tumor is a benign but aggressive tumor. It has tendency for local recurrence or mostly common in badiaphysis. Extended keratage is the treatment of choice. So, what would be our answer? Yes, very good. Now, let's learn in little detail about the tumors. Okay. So, before that, is my pace okay with you am i going fast or slow so just let me know if you want me to increase my pace or decrease my pace or you want any clarification regarding any topics yeah osteoclastoma yes very good jain cell okay Okay, go fast. So, I, you mean I, you want me to increase the speed, right? So, now let's learn about the tumors. So, in the tumors, it is uh, usually when the word tumor is uttered, you usually tend to say it is a benign or a malignant tumor. So, that is also accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll cover maximum. Right. So, tumors. So, in case of orthopedics, there are bone forming tumors. And then there are cartilage forming tumors. So there are bone forming, cartilage forming tumors. And then there are vascular tumors. And then there are special entity like the GCT which are benign but behaving malignant. And they are non-osseous, that is neuroectodermal tumors. And then there are bone-like lesions, uh, like sorry, tumor-like lesions. And then there is one more important, that is plasma cytoma. Right? So, what is this bone-forming tumor? Again, they could be benign. And they could be malignant. Example of benign bone forming tumor. Example of benign bone tu forming tumor. Can anybody please answer? So it is osteoid osteoma, right? Osteoblastoma also. Then malignant is osteosarcoma. And then cartilage benign is osteochondroma. And then there are n chondroma. Malignant is chondrosarcoma. Yeah, osteoosteoma, osteosarcoma, very good. And then it is vascular tumors. You have hemangioma and GCT special entity and neuroectodermal tumor is Ewing's sarcoma, right? And tumor-like conditions are your SBC or UBC, that is simple bone cyst or unicameral bone cyst or your ABC and fibrous this place yeah right and this plasma cytoma is nothing but your multiple 
myeloma okay secret secret you can start now start with this sprint and then appear for tomorrow's uh, grand test at 10 am so this is various uh, tumor conditions which you have to be uh, familiar with right so osteoastoma is this condition is mostly seen in age of 10 to 20 years and what is the peculiar feature of osteoastoma it is a bone forming where you can see nidus which is surrounded by a sclerotic bone and then the peculiar feature of this is night pains so it is associated with night pains which are relieved by taking nsaids or aspirin right so this is osteoastoma which is a, a very bone forming tumor so this is uh, it is mostly seen in 10 to 20 years of age it is uh, for, it is characterized by formation of the bone right and then the most peculiar feature is the night pains it is mostly seen in the night because of the production of prostaglandin pro, pro, pgs that is prostaglandins and then it is relieved by taking aspirin right and then there is osteosarcoma so we have dealt with osteoastoma then it is osteosarcoma so osteosarcoma is nothing but this is a malignant type see most common malignant tumor secondary after multiple myeloma is your osteosarcoma it is malignant type of tumor which is resulting in bone formation bone formation okay and then the or cell of origin the cell of origin of osteosarcoma is multipotent cell so this has various cells so that is it could be fibroblastic it could be osteoblastic or it could be chondroblastic right and the prediction for osteosarcoma is knee joint so upper end of femur and lower end of tibia so this is the area where you can usually see in the see the osteosarcoma and then the treatment for osteosarcoma is it was amputation way before so uh, it the treatment before was amputation and then now the treatment has been shifted to chemotherapy now chemotherapy has revolu revolutionized the treatment of osteosarcoma so first you treat with chemotherapy then you can also treat it with radiotherapy and then you can go for surgery so the surgery includes amputation or there is endoprosthesis so you can remove the tumor and reconstruct it with endoprosthesis right this is osteosarcoma and then coming to your gct so that is bone forming uh, various tumors so that is osteoid osteoma and osteosarcoma now let's learn about gct so joint cell tumor so joint cell tumor joint cell tumor is a peculiar tumor which is a benign tumor but it is aggressive what that does mean aggressive means it means that it has malignant features but it is not malignant so it usually occurs in epiphysis region right and then so there are various es which are associated with joint cell tumor so it is epiphysis it is epiphysal in origin and then it is eccentric and then it is expansile right and it the treatment is excision 
so it occurs at the epiphysis it encroaches on the joint but never extends the joint so it is the epiphyseal region the origin of jain cell tumor is epiphyseal region now here the cortex gets eroded it gets thinned out it is expansile that is it it has a tendency to expand so it is expansile but it will never cross the joint right and it is usually it is mostly it is usually seen in the epiphysis right and so this is the hpe is presence of jain cells yeah you can even add that also there it is axial cracking so the uh, clinical feature you can see is the axial cracking so the presence of jain cells hence it is called the osteoclastoma but this osteoclastoma wording is a misnomer because it is not the osteoclast it is only the resemblance of this jain cell to osteoclast then it is called as jain cell tumor okay but it is uh, 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 usually it is called as osteoclastoma it is just a misnomer right and then the treatment the treatment part is how do you treat it the treatment part is extended curettage so sometimes after curettage you can use bone grafting or then if it is not responding you can go with amputation or arthrodesis or arthroplasty so these are various treatment options which are available for your uh jain cell tumor so first is it is ep epiphysis then it is eccentric it is expansile lesion and the treatment is excision so one more you can add it as axial cracking right and then the presence of the jain cells is confirmative on your hp that is histopathological slide and the treatment is extended curettage with bone grafting right and then if it is not responding you can always go with arthrodesis or amputation and orthoplasty that is endoprosthesis which is placed right so that completes your gct so the answer here would be most commonly occurring in diaphysis so the answer is epiphysis yeah jain cell tumor one of more, one of the important peculiarities also it usually occurs after the maturity of the skeleton so it will not occur in premature skeleton right and then coming to the benign thing osteochondroma so what is osteochondroma so next is your osteo chondroma so osteochondroma is nothing but a cartilaginous tumor so it is your cartilagin producing tumor and usually it is seen in the premature skeleton so this is your osteochondroma right so it is somewhat it could be pedunculated or sessile and it is usually covered with the cartilaginous cap cartilaginous cap right so that is osteochondroma usually this does not require excision but if there is any other conditions like if it is associated with pain or bursitis or it is rapidly increasing in the uh, size then you have to go for excision of this osteochondroma so multiple enchondromatosis is called diaphyseal ecclesia So multiple and chondroma, multiple uh, chondromatosis is called diaphyseal ecclesia. So next we are dealing with enchondroma, right? So next we are dealing with enchondroma. So what is enchondroma? It is also one more cartilaginous tumor. It's mostly seen in the uh, small bones like your bones of hand and feet, right? 
and there are two important conditions which are associated is Ollier syndrome and Mafusi syndrome right so what is Ollier syndrome Ollier syndrome is multiple enchondromatosis is Ollier syndrome and Mafusi is this multiple enchondromatosis when associated with cavernous hemangioma this is called your Mafusi syndrome so one of the important point here this is non hereditary so your Ollier syndrome is non hereditary Mafusi is hereditary right so this is about the enchondromatosis enchondromatosis so these are enchondroma which are present cartilaginous tumors which are present on the hands that is small bones hands and your feet and they, they may present in multiple time multiple uh, uh, in number that is multiple enchondromatosis there are associated with Ollier's disease and then Mafusi syndrome right and next hemangioma hemangioma there are more nothing important points about it but the x-ray appearance is what is the x-ray appearance of hemangioma so the hemangioma is quadri in appearance because there is build, there will be a loss of horizontal striations and the vertical striations over the vertebrae are present and will this will and this will uh, present you as a quadri appearance so that is the important thing which you have to remember about hemangioma then coming to ewing sarcoma so ewing sarcoma is usually pass positive so that is the important feature here and then it is usually seen in children's aging to 4 to 10 years and what is the periosteal reaction which is occurring in Ewing sarcoma onion peel appearance right onion peel appearance and then <clears throat> let's see few tumor like condition so few tumor like conditions are ABC and UBC right so this is unicameral bone cyst and this is aneurysmal bone cyst unicameral bone cyst is usually the single cyst which is present central in location this is usually eccentric ABC are eccentric and in UBC the width will will always be in respect to the epiphysis so the width will not increase the U, ubc width will not be more than your epiphysis but this is again it is expensile so it is mostly seen in the metaphysis this is also mostly seen in the metaphysis right the fallen leaf sign the fallen leaf sign right it is in case of any pathological fracture which is occurring at the level of SBC. So, this fallen leaf sign is seen. So, you have to remember the fallen leaf sign, right? And what is ABC? ABC, it is blood filled cavity which is present in eccentric locations and most common uh, type is your humerus so humerus you will see this condition and you have to differentiate it with your gct right and then multiple fibrous dysplasia so let's read about fibrous dysplasia very important quick points fibrous dysplasia so what is fibrous dysplasia so where the bone is replaced by your fibrous tissue now bone is getting replaced by your fibrous tissue is fibrous dysplasia important point here is it could be mono monostatic or polyostatic and the shepherd crook deformity shepherd crook deformity so the shepherd crook deformity is the deformity which is seen in your fibrous dysplasia so bending of the femur bone results in a condition called shepherd crook deformity right and the treatment is usually surgical right so this is about fibrous dysplasia so that covers your topic of tumors so there are various tumors which we have discussed like osteoastoma and uh, osteosarcoma and then osteochondroma and chondroma chondrosarcoma we have left so chondrosarcoma is one more important cartilaginous tumor next to 
your osteosarcoma. So in cartilage after, so the most common would be multiple myeloma followed by osteosarcoma and it is followed by a chondrosarcoma. In chondrosarcoma, the important point, it is very slow growing. See, cartilaginous tumors are usually slow growing tumors. And here you will see popcorn type of calcification. So that is very important. Popcorn type of calcification. So that is the important point in chondrosarcoma. Right? So it is also has a prediction to occur near the knee joint. So that is about your chondrosarcoma. And in osteosarcoma, we have uh, forgot to discuss the radiological features. So the two important radiological features you have to remember is the periosteal reaction. So that is your Codman's triangle and then your sunray appearance. Right? So, Codman's triangle and sunray appearance. So, Codman's triangle is nothing but your periosteum elevation which is seen at the end of the bone. Periosteum elevation and then your sunray appearance. So, here the calcification, the osteoid formation will occur along the vessel. So, that is called your sunray appearance. Right. So, that completes your tumor part. And next, this is one more question. So, identify the implant shown in the X-ray and its method of fixation. So, what is the implant which is shown in this x-ray and its method of fixation? C. The answer is directly given here. It is nailing which is seen and it gives you relative stability. So, let us understand few important points about the fixations, right? So, here the fracture fixations are so done by two important methods like it could be a rigid fixation which will give absolute stability and next one is your relative stability, right. So, to understand this, you have to understand the femur fracture healing, right. So, this fracture healing can be of two types. So, it could be a direct method or next it could be a indirect method. So, what is this direct method where the callus is formed, right? Indirect method, there is no callus and this is called your relative fixation where you are allowing the fracture to heal by callus formation. Here it is no callus formation. So, this is your absolute fixation. So, what are the various implants which are used to do this? So, ab relative stability or absolute stability, right? In case of relative stability, so you are allowing the fracture to heal by callus, right? So, callus should be formed. This is done by a load sharing device that is your nailing system. So, in case of nails, there will be a load sharing. So, the load is shared on the bone and the and the implants, right? And then there is absolute stability. So, there is no callus formation and then it will result in. So, this is done by load bearing devices. So, load bearing devices are nothing but your plates. So, whatever the plates or nails have been used, it is used based upon the a uh, fracture pattern. So, if you want to treat such a fracture, so this is a long bone, a femur bone, where this should be uh, encouraged to form in with a callus, right? So, bone healing should be direct with callus formation, right? So, this is a femoral nail where the callus is formed. So, this is direct type and this is a load sharing device. So, there will be a relative stability and it is the internal fixation, right? And if you see a plate, for example, if you have the, given this x-ray, so what is this?
so this is a plate so here we have used a dcp for plating the fracture so here we have required the absolute stability so there should be no callus formation so we have used a plate so this is plating right so what are the various plates which are being used so this is your dcp so what is dcp it is your dynamic compression plate so here if there's if this is a fracture if you see a bone and here so this is your bone right and here is the fracture so this part this part now you have plated with your dcp right so this part whatever the part is left in between without holes this is over the fracture side and you fix the fracture with the screws on the opposite side and when you tighten the screws it will compress the fracture hence it is called dynamic compression plate so the compression will happen over the fracture side uh, with, with the tightening of the screws hence it is called dcp the dynamic compression plate and with this is your what type of plate is this This is a recon plate, right? This is a recon plate. So you can use for calcaneum fractures, and there are there are various shapes in it. So calcaneum requires it's this type of recon plates, and these are all locking screws. When will you say this is a locking screw and conventional screw hole? So this is the when the threads are present. This is called locking plate, and locking plate is always given with a conventional hole so there will be a threaded part and a non threaded part so this is a lo locking screw locking screw is used for the threaded part so the screws are also different so there is a locking screw and this is the non threaded part you can use the cortical screw right so these are the various plates and the implants which are used for your absolute stability and the relative stability so relative stability is by your nailing system that is you encourage the callus formation so absolute stability is rigid fixation where the no callus is required where are the areas where you require rigid and where are the areas where you required abs uh, relative stability so in case of articular fractures articular fractures and periarticular fractures you require no callus formation so this callus should not obstruct the joint movements so hence we require absolute stability right there should be no callus so here articular or periarticular fracture you use plates right in case of long bone shaft fractures shaft fractures so here you will treat it with nailing right so here you require callus formation for the bone to heal and the bone should be strong right so the weight bearing bones so they should be strong so you to encourage the callus formation you use nailing so nails are used for long bones and plates are used for your uh, articular or periarticular so why in forearm are we using plate so forearm is also long bone so why are we using plates in forearm so as i i have shown this x ray right this x ray i have this is the forearm bone so there is a radius plating which has been done here so for why are we using this plate in the forearm so can somebody answer so in case of forearm the bones the two bones which are present with the interosseous membrane with the interosseous membrane together will act as a joint right so there are the druj and the pruj proximal radial nerve and distal radial nerve which are responsible for your supination and pronation so this is acting like a joint the interosseous membrane so here also you will have no callus formation 
which will disrupt your joint movements hence you go for your absolute stability right so this is your absolute stability in case of forearm bones right so forearm bones long bones are use you use your nails right Oh, sorry, forearm bones and your periarticular fractures, you use plates for rigid fixation and in long bones, you use nails. That is intramedullary interlocking nails. So, somebody wants to know what is interlocking. So, if this is a fracture, right, and uh, this is the bone and here is the fracture. So, we are putting a nail into it. So, in previously, it was K nail, that is Kuncher's nail, which was used and it was helping in healing of the fractures but this nailing system had not given this kunches nail has not given the stability in rotations stability in rotations so now we are fixing it with screws so we are interlocking it right two screws above two screws below right so when we interlock it above and below it will cause stability it will give stability even in case of rotations so that is how it has been named as interlocking intramedullary inside the medulla in intra interlocking intramedullary femoral nail right so this is the table we have already dealt with relative stability and absolute stability so let's go to the next question the following are the markers of bone formation except So, can you please answer this question? So, the following are the markers of bone formation except. So, the answer would be. So, the answer is D, right. Very good. So, it is cross-linked N and C telopeptide. So, why have this become answer of bone resorption? So, there are two conditions. So, one is bone formation and bone resorption. So, there is nothing to learn in detail about this. This is the one-liner. So, what are the factors which help for bone formation is mainly your collagen. So, if you remember the bone which is made up of organic and inorganic, right? So, organic is again cells and matrix so here you have this collagen and various osteocalcin osteoprogenin and all so this whenever the bone is forming here so there will be bone formation markers so that is collagen osteocalcin and bone specific alkaline phosphate which is increased and when bone is resorbed so bone is broken into pieces then there will be cross-linked n and c telopeptides which are seen in the serum so there will be a increase of this when a for bone resorption right so bone is collagen correct collagen type 1 so, let us learn in detail about stages of bone healing. So, once have you understood the, so if this is your bone and fractured, so there is various stages which will result in formation of bone healing. So, there are various stages which you have to know will cause the bone healing. So, as soon as the bone is fractured, it will result in the first stage which is called as stage of stage of hematoma, right? And then there will be stage of granulation tissue. And then there is stage of soft callus and stage of hard callus right and the final and the last stage is stage of remodeling so why are these important so we see to understand the non-union to understand the malunion you have to understand the stages so that further 
topics will be easy. So what is the stage of hematoma? As soon as the fracture, as soon as the bone fractures, it will result in your hematoma formation. So when will this occur? It will occur within 3 to 6 hours. So there will be hematoma formation. So what is this hematoma? The blood cap, the capillaries, all the capillaries. So the capillaries here, they get ruptured. And then they will result in hematoma formation. So now the fracture fixation by AO, this is our Bible for orthopedics. So AO concepts are used for treating the fracture. So in AO concept now the uh, fixation of fracture has been shifted to biological fixation. That means the fracture hematoma should be preserved. Previously it was whenever the fracture was there they used to open the fracture clear the hematoma completely and then they used to fix it with a plate or a nail. What would, what would be easy for that particular fracture but now the shift which towards your biological fixation where it is the preservation of hematoma preservation of hematoma because this hematoma whatever is there it is rich in growth factors right so this is rich in growth factors and hence this will enhance enhance your bone healing so to preserve this hematoma, we are intro we are introducing various various other uh, surgeries like minimally invasive techniques, uh, MIPO techniques, where the fracture hematoma is not opened and the plate is put by incision made above the fracture. You pass the plate like this and then you fix it with the screws under CM guidance. So that is called MIPO. So minimally invasive plating osteosynthesis right so that is a MIPO technique which is used it has come with the concept of preservation of this fracture hematoma this fracture hematoma is very rich biologically with rich in growth factors which will enhance your fracture healing and then there is stage of granulation tissue so you already know there are various osteoprogenitises which are present around the fracture site which will enhance the bone healing then there is stage of so this hematoma is within three days and this is somewhere within Two weeks and this is three weeks this is three months and this is three years so after the granulation tissue then there will be a soft callus formation soft callus is nothing but the bone the bones a soft bone which is formed the immature bone which is formed because of the osteoprogenitor cells differentiating into the osteoblastic cells and they produce this whatever bone is there that is called soft callus or the osteoid. Then now this bone becomes hardened. So this is called the hard callus that will be in range of three months right. So whenever so why this is important. So we will ask the patient to take rest up to, for up to three to six weeks after fracture fixation because we will initiate the soft callus and after the soft callus is performed we will ask the patient to mobilize so control mobilization is permitted only after seeing this soft callus so that is how your bone healing is important clinically so you have to understand so first there will be hematoma then granulation tissue then there will be soft callus too so during this soft callus stage you will encourage the patient to weight bear and then by three months there will be hard callus and there is another very important topic that is remodeling of the bone which will happen so this is important for no scar over the bone so wherever you do surgery you can see the scar but on the bone there will be no scar on the bone because of this process called remodeling and the whatever the fracture has been appended it will be completely healed and the bone will look normally as it was before after three years so that is called remodeling so how is this process of remodeling is done it is done by your osteoclast right this osteoclast so if you see these are the Jane's felt with the ruffled borders right and this will eat away the bone it will cause bone resorption and then over it the new bone is formed basing upon the forces applied on that particular part. So this is bone form that is osteo. So that is bone formation. So resorption followed by bone formation which is then result in a similar to bone uh, condition so if uh, be after before the fracture how the bone was there it will same look 
similar to the before fracture condition. So, this is called remodeling. So, it is done by a osteoclast where it will call bone resorption and the new bone is initiated there itself and the osteoblast will come and lay the new bone. So, this process will take up to a year. So, it, it, you can remember it as 3 days, 2 weeks, 3 weeks, then 3 months and then it is 3 years, right? Okay, having said that about the healing, now let's see little about your uh, nerve injuries, right? So, this is a condition where a female of age 25 years has presented with hand weakness and paresthesias over the ulnar aspect of the hand since 2 weeks. So, history of injury around the elbow present is treated conservatively. On examination, there was an extension of MCP and flexion of PIP noted on the little and the ring finger, right? So, when the clue here is it is your ulnar nerve palsy. So, as there is a tingling and numbness, so, there is tingling and numbness which is present over the ulnar aspect. So, that means it is your ulnar nerve palsy. So, in ulnar nerve palsy, now what would be the nerve and muscle palsy responsible for such an effect? If it was ulnar nerve palsy, then it should be a clawing. Right, but here there is no clawing. If you can observe, there is no clawing seen. So, what is that effect called as? So, what is that effect called as? It is called as ulnar Yeah, ulnar clawing is not present. They have just closed this fist. So, this is called as ulnar paradox, right? So, this is called ulnar paradox. Usually, what is this paradox is, whenever there is a low ulnar nerve palsy, low ulnar nerve palsy, because of strong pull of your flexor muscles, other flexor muscles which are not paralyzed will cause this clawing. So, in low ulnar nerve palsy, the clawing is prominent. Clawing is prominent. In case of high ulnar nerve palsy, if you talk about high ulnar nerve palsy, that is at the level of elbow, it will result in less clawing. So, this is nothing but your ulnar paradox. Why? What is the reason for this ulnar paradox? Because what is causing clawing here? So, the clawing is because of paralysis of your lumbrical muscles, but your FTP is intact in case of your low ulnar nerve palsy, right? So, this FTP will cause further flexion of your IP joints, right? So, there will be high clawing. The clawing will be more prominent. In case of high ulnar nerve palsy, high ulnar nerve palsy, the FDP is paralyzed. So, there is no pull of the flexors of IP. Hence, there is less clawing. So, this is your ulnar paradox. So, that is how you have to remember that is the ulnar paradox. So, here the answer would be ulnar nerve lumbricals plus FTP then the clawing is reduced, right? So, now let us learn about the nerve palsies, right? So, nerve palsies. So, what are the classifications of nerve palsies? Quick classification of nerve palsies. There are two important classifications which you have to remember. So, there are, what are the two important classifications? Both starts with S and S. So, one is Sedans and second one is your Sundarlands classification. Right? 
what is adan's classification so they are again divided into three types of ulnar palsies so first one is your neuropraxia the second one is your axonotemesis and third one is your neurotemesis right and then there is sunderland classification so sunderland classification is again type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 and type 5 so what is type 1 it is equivalent to your neuropraxia where what is neuropraxia there will be damage to your only the flow of axoplasm is disrupted flow of axoplasm is disrupted right that is neuropraxia type 1 so what is type 2 type 2 is there is damage to the axon so axoplasm then axon and then type 3 is damage to your endoneurium type 4 is perineurium damage and type 5 is epineurium damage right so there is axonotemesis neurotemesis and neuropraxia in case of sedans and sunderland's classification is neuropraxia axon damage and then the damage to the endoneurium and then the damage to the perineurium in case of type 4 and damage to the epineurium in case of type 5 right so this neurotemesis is equivalent to your epineurium so this is equal to your type 5 right and this is equivalent to your axonotemesis sorry so this is equivalent to your neurotemesis and this is your axonotemesis right axon damage is equal to into axonotemesis right so what why are this classification important to us so to tell the prognosis so to tell the prognosis it is neuropraxia it is 100% recovery because it is only the concussion which is occurring in the axoplasm flow as soon as the axoplasm flow is recovered the recovery is present right and how what is the flow rate of flow of axoplasm in the recovery so it is 1 mm per day right the axoplasm flow would be 1 mm per day we will deal about the supracondylar fracture humerus don't worry and in case of axonotemesis there is a one important condition which you have to remember is your valerian degeneration right what is this valerian degeneration it is a condition of healing of your nerve healing of the nerve takes place through your valerian degeneration and in case of neuropraxia what you have to remember is there is 100% recovery in case of neuropraxia and here from here it is doubtful recovery so here also it might reach to 100% in axon damage but from damage to the endo peri and epineurium it is always a doubtful recovery and what is the important sign which you will evaluate for the nerve classification <clears throat> important sign that is your that is your what is the sign it is your tinel sign very good it is your tinel sign so you are going to tap the nerve from the distal to proximal so if the tinel sign is present or positive that means the nerve signs of recovery right there will there are signs of recovery so that is your tinel sign so what are the various nerves let us see so carpal tunnel syndrome is associated with which type of nerve carpal tunnel syndrome what is the nerve involved carpal tunnel syndrome is your carpal tunnel syndrome is your median nerve 
So where is Allah now seen? So Allah now is compressed in your Gaian's canal. So Allah now is Gaian's canal. Tarsal tunnel is Tarsal tunnel syndrome is your posterior tibial nerve. <clears throat> And then your supinator syndrome. So the supinator or the pronator syndrome. What is the supinator syndrome or pronator syndrome? Which nerve is involved in the supinator or pronator syndrome? Yeah, it is posterior tibial. Supinator or pronator syndrome which is involved? Your posterior introscious nerve that is pin. Posterior introscious nerve is involved in case of supinator or a pronator syndrome. Right. So this is the uh, what I have tried to explain you. So whenever this FDP flexor, uh, flexor digitorium profundus is not affected it will cause the flexion of your DIP which is cause more prominent clawing right and if FDP is not working means that is paralyzed there will be no flexion of your DIP joint. So this DIP joint is not flexed. So this is, is less prominent clawing right. So this is what I have made to try try to make you understand right and next question so let's go to next question okay read the question a four years old boy presents with history of fall at school resulting in fractures of femur shaft right so there's a femur shaft fracture and previous history of multiple fractures are present and history of similar conditions is noted in the family and father found to have blue sclera which of the following are true about these conditions except So, what is the answer? So, come on guys, I am waiting for your answer. What is the answer? So, what is this condition? What is the answer? I am asking which of the following are true about this condition except. So let me answer for you. So this is a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. So, this is a condition in which there is a deficient collagen because of the genetic call call 1 a 1 gene and call 2 a 2 gene. So, 2 else for call a 2 gene. So, these two genes are defective hence there will be deficient collagen which will result in defective bone formation. So, whenever there is defective bone formation that will result in formation of fractures. So, the fracture easily right. So, now this is in combination with dentigenous imperfecta that is the teeth are also involved. It is a triad dentigenous imperfecta osteogenesis imperfecta with blue sclera. This is the triad of osteogenesis imperfecta. The genes which are defective are 
collagen 1 call, call 1 a1 gene and call 2 a2 gene so this is your collagen 1 a1 gene which are defective and collagen 1 a2 gene which are defective and because the bone is formed with collagen with hydroxyapatite crystals so whenever this collagen the osteo itself is weak this will result in easy fractures but remember the fracture union is never impaired. So, there is no problem with fracture union. It is only the problem with easy. The bones are very soft and they break down easily. So, in case of osteogenesis imperfecta, you will always see various fracture healing stages in one particular person. So, this is a condition which can be diagnosed antenatally on scan. So, multiple fractures with blue sclera running in the family is suggestive of osteogenesis imperfecta and as already said it is inheritance is autosomal dominant inheritance right and it is hereditary and it has various types there are six types of osteogenesis imperfecta which are seen right this is about osteogenesis imperfecta so we have to remember is there is no impairment in fracture union so how many ever the fractures are formed they will heal no impairment right there is no impairment in fracture healing impairment in fracture healing and this is a condition where fractures in multiple stages are seen in one particular person that is usually child so, you have to always remember that the fractures are been healing properly but there is the bones are soft and it will result in multiple fractures, right? So, they might be associated with the joint laxity in adults because the ligaments, the tendons, whatever which are made by collagen are weak, right? So, this is about osteogenesis imperfecta. So, for you I have bought this x-rays. So, these are also called vermion bones, right? What is the treatment of this? Treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta, you can go for surgical fixation or prophylactic fixation or one more important interesting term is your sheikh kebab fixation. What is the sheikh kebab fixation? Where the bone, so these are the bones are break down into pieces. So this is your sheik kebab fixation in case of osteogenesis so you will see various deformities you see fractures and you see various stages of healing in that particular fractures and there are various striations if you see these are the vermion bones and these are the deformities here these are the deformities so this is healing fracture this is also healing fracture so this is deformed tibia bones so this is deformities are usually present in a kid so this is the osteogenesis imperfecta so this is the blue sclera which i have mentioned with the triad so this is blue sclera but uh, significant for osteogenesis imperfecta. So, the collagen gene is defective here, hence the condition. So, next, what is the next question? The next question is congenital displacement of hip. The treatment of choice for a child less than 6 months. What would be a treatment of child in a congenital hip with the age of less than 6 months? So, Marfan syndrome, what is Marfan syndrome? It is laxity of ligaments, only the joints becomes lax, right? So, it is not the fractures of the bones which are seen in Marfan's, it is only the ligaments which are lax, that is Marfan syndrome, right? So, what is the answer for this? In CDS, the treatment of choice for a child less than 6 months is? So, the answer is public hardness splint, right? So, the answer is public hardness splint. So, what is congenital displacement of hip? So, congenital dysplasia of a hip is a condition which is where the hips are dislocated. It could be, the reason could be acetabular dysplasia. That means the formation of acetabulum is not proper during the birth itself or the most common cause is idiopathic right and in congenital dysplasia of hip usually you see it in females and firstborn 
फर्स्ट बॉर्न बेबीज एंड इन केस ऑफ फॉल्टी यूट्राइन प्रेजेंटेशंस लाइक योर ब्रीच प्रेजेंटेशंस राइट सो यूजली दिस इज द एरियाज वेर यू सी योर सी डी हेच सो वॉट इज सी डी हेच इट इज कंजेनाइटल डिसलोकेशन ऑफ द हिप द हिप्स आर इजिली डिसलोकेटेड एंड दिस कुड बी द रीजन कुड बी योर एसिटेबुलर डिसप्लेसिया और द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज इज योर इडियोपैथिक राइट मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज इज इडियोपैथिक एंड इट इज सीन इन फीमेल्स इट इज सीन इन फर्स्ट पॉन्स एंड इन केसेज वेर द ब्रीच प्रेजेंटेशन इज प्रेजेंट दैट इज फॉल्टी यूट्रन और क्राउडेड पोजिशन क्राउडेड पोजिशन ऑफ बेबीज सो दिस इज द सी डी हेच so in cdh what are the important points so in cdh you see two important test which should be done in the infants or not infants in the newborn that is in the newborns and this will act as the screening test for ddh so what are the two test quickly it is otorolony and it is barlow's test right so barlow's test is nothing but your exit so you can remember it as barlow that is barlow's test and otorolony is entrance so that is you can bring the hips back into the socket right so this in barlow's you take the hips back so you you wantedly dislocate hip with such maneuver that is barlow's you cause adduction of the hip and then with the abduction the hip will the, the the hips again enters into the socket so these are two screening tests which are used in the newborns for for newborns for diagnosing your cdh then there would be various other clinical features so now the thigh folds which are present thigh folds which are present that becomes prominent and then there is clisic test what is this clisic test so if you examine the both the knee joints so one joint would be low that on the flexion position so if you flex the both the knees in flexed position if both the knees are flexed like this so whatever whichever is affected will be low so this is your clisic test and then if in case of adults they will present with lumbar lordosis so this is about your ddh so what is the treatment for ddh so treatment for ddh is if it is age up to 6 months you can treat it with pavlik harness or what is one more splint which is used for ddh so one more splint which is used for ddh other than pavlik pavlik harness it is von rosen splint so you can use your von rosen splint or pavlik harness up to the age of 6 months and from 6 to 18 months you used closed or open reduction with your spica what is this spica it is this hip spica hip spica immobilization so less than 6 months you go with splinting right and more than 6 months to 18 months you go with reduction that it could be closed or open reduction plus hip spica and if it is more than 18 months you go with something known as osteotomy so there you have to always go with open reduction and then with your osteotomies this osteotomy can be a femoral osteotomy or a pelvic osteotomy so the various osteotomies such as salter's osteotomy pemberton's osteotomy or charis osteotomy or charis osteotomy so these are various osteotomy osteotomies which are mentioned for the treating of ddh right next question a female athlete of age 22 years presented with pain in the elbow since 2 weeks so here there is a pain in the elbow so grossly there is a pain and on examination the lateral condyle tenderness is elicited so which of the following test is used to confirm the diagnosis answer so whenever i say it is a lateral condyle tenderness and lateral condyle is known for the origin of the extensor tendons so what is this test so i will explain you in detail all the tests then you can answer this so it is cousin's test right the answer is 
Cousin's test. So why the answer is Cousin's test? So the various test here. So what is Cousin's test? So you know the lateral epicondyle. This is your lateral epicondyle and you ask the patient to flex the you extend the wrist because the extensors are present on the lateral side and patient is asked to extend the wrist against resistance. So whenever a pain is produced in the lateral epicondyle on extension of the wrist is called your Cousin's test and this is the test for your which condition I am talking about? This is a condition called tennis elbow. So a famous cricketer who has popularized this disease is Sachin Tendulkar. So and you remember this tennis elbow is most commonly seen in non-tennis players like cricket players and uh, other sports athletes, right? So Sachin Tendulkar in our country has popularized this tennis elbow, right? Okay, this is the Cosen test which is used for testing your tennis elbow. Then what is Finkelstein's test used for? So let me write your test for you. So it is Cosen's test which is used for testing your tennis elbow. And then you have your Finkelstein test for D. Curvain's tenosynovitis. So what is this D. Curvain's tenosynovitis? So it is the APL and EPB. So these two extensors, the so first compartment extensors. The first compartment extensors, the tenosynovitis, the inflammation of the synovial sheath will cause the inflammation of the tendons that is APL and EPB. So this is your APL and EPB and Finkelstein test is you have to ask the patient to flex the thumb over the palm and close your fingers and then to flex it. So this will cause so resistant again you have to cause the you have to again ask the patient to extend the thumb like this in this way in this way you have to ask the patient to extend the thumb so again there will be a pain over the radial side so that is d curvens tenosynovitis that is the tendons of the first compartment so how many compartments how many extensor compartments do we have we have six extensor compartments so the first compartment is apl and epb which gets compressed here and this will result in your D. Curvain's tenosynovitis, right? D. Curvain's tenosynovitis, I have already mentioned there, right? And what is the second compartment syndrome? Can anybody tell me what is the second, com second compartment syndrome? So keep answering that. And next, so these are the tests. And next, it has given us Allen's test. So what is this Allen's test? It is for to check the integrity of integrity of radial and ulnar anastomosis so how is the hand supplied by radial and ulnar nerve it is through the anastomosis right so to check the uh, radial nerve is in co competent or ulnar nerve is competent ulnar artery so this is radial and ulnar artery competences are checked by this allen's test to test the anastomosis right and then thomas test what is thomas test thomas test is used for your ffd what is ffd fixed flexion deformity of hip right so it is fixed flexion deformity of hip joint is tested by your Thomas test. So in this test you act as the patient to be in supine position then you flex uh, and flex the hip joint unaffected uh, hip joint is flexed over the abdomen and then there will be a fixed, ex, fixed flexion deformity which you can elicit in your affected limb. So that is the Thomas test used for FFD that is fixed flexion deformity of the hip. So that is the various test. So likewise there are various tests again MTCAN test for supraspinatus, belly button test for subscapularis so this is supraspinatus and then there is subscapularis and in the knee joint you have various tests for shoulder dislocations you have Dugas test so where for shoulder dislocation and there is SLRT that is straight leg raising test 
so there are two types in this so one is active slrt and another one is your passive slrt so active slrt to evaluate the hip joint and passive slrt to evaluate your disc pathology and there is trendlinberg test for your abductor mechanism so these are few of the test which are present you can just uh, yeah the arch yeah uh, so these are few tests which can be asked in your exam these are all one liners so empty can test is for supraspinatus these two are for your rotator cuffs right these are your rotator cuffs right and then if this is for Dugas test you have to ask the patient to touch the opposite side of your shoulder if you are suspecting the shoulder that is shoulder dislocation of your right then you have to ask the patient to touch your left opposite shoulder so if he is able to touch the opposite shoulder that means you can rule out your shoulder dislocation that is your Dugas test the empty can test you ask the patient to put like this that inverted thumb and then you have to ask the patient to extend extend that is lift the lift abduct the abduct against the resistance so the surgeon will offer the resistance over the hand and will ask them to lift the hand if patient is unable to do then this is called empty can test for testing supraspinatus and then there is straight leg raising test so here you ask the patient to raise the leg straight so the leg is like this and without any support you ask the patient to lift the leg in air so this is to evaluate the hip pathology so that is in case you have IC fractures. So, in case of the hip pathologies as IC fractures, this SLRT, the active test, the patient will be unable to do. And then there is passive SLRT. Passive SLRT is the surgeon lifts the and there causes whenever you really lift your limb passively, there will be a stretch of the sciatic nerve. So, whenever the stretch of sciatic nerve, it will cause pain so that wincing of the patient on passive slrt will indicate the disc pathology and then there is a trendlenburg test trendlenburg test is for your abductor mechanism so hip joints there is abductor mechanisms of hip joint hip joint so in hip joint there are abductors what are the two abductors abductor two abductors which are present so one is your gluteus medius and gluteus minimus so the test for gluteus medius and gluteus minimus is nothing but your trendlenburg test so what is that second compartment syndrome can you explain so what is that second i'm asking you the question is given to you what is the second compartment syndrome known as it is called your intersection syndrome so what is the second compartment tendons is your Extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis. So that is your intersection syndrome for second nerve. That completes your various tests. Now answer this question. Name the angle measured in this image. What is the angle which is measured in this image? Quickly. So it is your Cobb's angle. So, this is the angle for testing the, not for testing, quantification of a condition in the spine which is called scoliosis. So, let's learn in little detail about the scoliosis. So, scoliosis is nothing but your sideward bending of spine. So, sideward bending, S for S, we all know that is scoliosis, right? And then in scoliosis, there is Cobb's angle which you have to quantify. So, how do you quantify the Cobb's angle? So, here this diagram will explain you in detail. So, scoliosis is nothing but sideward tilting of the vertebra. This is your apex vertebra where the deformity is maximum, right? This is your apex deformity, apex uh, level and this is your end vertebra. This is called mo end vertebra. So, how do you identify the end vertebra? You have to lie, draw a line of both end plates if they are parallel that means it is not involved if you law, draw a line and if the length this this whatever is the width if it is decreased and if it is participating in this curve so if you see it is tilted right so these are converging some somewhere here so this is your 
end vertebra so you have to identify like that the end vertebras and you have to draw a line which is parallel to the end vertebras right this is your end vertebra we are drawing lines parallel to it and then perpendiculars to the this lines whatever the end vertebra is drawn the perpendicular line is drawn over that lines so this is your cobb's angle so both this and this will be equal so that is law of something so the both the angles are equal and that is called your cobb's angle so why the cobb's angle is measured to quantify scoliosis so how do you quantify based on cobb's angle so if this angle is less than 20 degrees you can still wait and watch okay and then if it is 20 to 50 degrees you go with braces that is orthrosis and then if it is more than 50 degrees, you go with surgical fixation. So, surgical correction is required. So, that is why you have to me measure the Cobb's angle. So, it could be done with a simple investigation like radiograph and x-ray. You have to just identify the curve and you have to identify the end vertebrae and draw parallel lines along the end vertebrae and draw perpendiculars to that particular lines and this will result in an angle which is called as Cobb's angle. So, based on the Cobb's angle, if it is less than 20 degrees, you will call, you will wait and watch so that is nothing but you will observe so observation and if it is 20 to 50 you go with arthrosis what are the true arthrosis which are used here what are the braces so they are boston brace and milwaukee brace right so these are two boss then if it is more than 50 you go for osteotomy correction so surgical correction that is osteotomy so remember three o's for Cobb's angle right and the orthrosis which are used is boston and milwaukee braces which are used so that is about scoliosis and usually it is seen in who are more prone for scoliosis it is usually seen in females and scoliosis can be of two types right it could be structural scoliosis or non-structural scoliosis non-structural scoliosis is nothing but your postural scoliosis right and structural scoliosis could be idiopathic or it could be developmental right so it is pathological and what is research sign one more important sign in scoliosis is your research sign so what is this research sign research sign is nothing but the iliac apophysis so before maturity the iliac apophysis which is not fused is graded so based upon the grading based on grading you can still comment whether this scoliosis curve will progress or not right so if the physis is fused it means there will be stop of the progression of the curve if the apophysis is not fused that means there is still a pro there is still a uh, chance of the curve to grow that is it might grow from 20 to 30 30 to 40 like that but if the apophysis is fused then there is probability the curve doesn't grow so that is the importance of research sign which is seen in your iliac apophysis so research sign is about iliac apophysis in case of scoliosis right so that is all about your scoliosis next so now next uh, next question which of the following is considered as the most sensitive test for diagnosis of anterior cruciate ligament so i think most of you can answer this question So, the answer is Latchman's test. So, there are various tests which are being indicated for the ligaments around the knee joint. So, if you see, the knee joint is stabilized by two cruciate ligaments, which are intraarticular and intrasynovial intraarticular and intrasynovial 
and then there are two menisci and there are two collateral ligaments right these are collateral ligaments so these cruciate ligaments are of two that is anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate so i know you all know the origin and insertion of anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate what will this do this acl that is anterior cruciate ligament will prevent the anterior translation of tibia right similarly the posterior cruciate will prevent the posterior translation of tibia right so now there are various tests to confirm the tear so whenever there is a tear of acl or rupture of acl then this will result in instability of knee joint right there will be a instability of knee joint so there will be anterior translation of the knee joint which is called as giving away so the typically the patient presents with a history of giving away so give away history of give away will be present and that is the indication of instability then you will perform a particular test what is that test called it is called the anterior drawers test right so it is to test your acl that is anterior cruciate ligament then for pcl it is posterior drawers test similarly the pcl is there the pcl will prevent posterior translation of the tibia and one important sign which you have to see for post pcl is your posterior sag sign right so before performing this anterior uh, this anterior adt or pdt you have to always examine for posterior sag so whenever there is a posterior sag you have to put the pcl so otherwise you will push that you the, the if you will think that the movement of from posterior to neutral is your adt positive so that is not positive the anterior translation should be from the neutral to anterior right if there is a posterior sag you might feel that the sag you correcting the sag you feel that the adt is positive so that is why before performing your anterior drawers test you have to be sure that there is no posterior sag and then the translation of tibia so you will hold the knee joint in such a way that you are trying to pull it forward right so from the neutral to forward if it is moving then this is called anterior translation and anterior drawers test positive right and then there are two menisci two menisci which are present and what is the importance of meniscus there is medial meniscus and there is lateral meniscus so the medial meniscus is attached to if you see here this is your acl this is your pcl and this is your medial meniscus and this is your lateral meniscus so now the medial meniscus whatever is there it is usually attach it to your capsule and uh, it is integrated into the capsule hence it is immobile and hence it is prone for injury right and then lateral meniscus it is free of attachments so hence it can escape escape the injury less prone right so this is medial and lateral meniscus and then there are two collateral ligaments so one is your medial collateral that is mcl and your lateral collateral ligaments so mcl and lcl so what does this mcl and lcl will do it will provide stabilization so in case of valgus force this mcl right and in case of lcl varus force is required for injury and there will be opening of your lateral compartment so these are various things which you have to understand about your uh, knee joint and here in the acl we have one more important test called the latchman's test and there is a pivot shift test right 
latchmans and pivot shifters so now coming to the most sensitive which one is the most sensitive latchmans is most sensitive why it is called most sensitive and pivot shift is most specific right So specific for ACL is pivot shift test and more sensitive is latchman's. Latchman's is done in it is uh, latchman's is done even in your uh, painful condition. So even if you are injured immediately, immediately you can perform this test. But ACL you can't flex the knee joint in case of acute injuries. So latchman's is considered to be most sensitive. So that is the answer for your question. So what is the most sensitive is your latchman's test. What is most specific is your pivot shift test you can use this as a screening for acl right so coming to treatment of meniscus so which injuries we have to do surgery so you if you see meniscus here there is a tear in the meniscus right so as i've already told you there is a medial meniscus which is more prone for injury so if you understand the meniscus in detail there is a blood supply which is from the periphery to the central so the blood supply is from periphery to the central right so this is your peripheral part and this is your central part why this is important is in peripheral part there are blood vessels so this is called red red zone and this is called your red white zone and this is called your white white zone so this area is white white and this area is red red so whenever there is any tear in your red red zone so any tear in your red red zone you can go for repair and this will heal because of the blood supply but in case of white white zone you have to go for meniscectomy right so healing potential is absent in case of white white zone and you go for meniscectomy so nowadays all the surgeries are performed through arthroscopy so either it would be arthroscopic repair or arthroscopic meniscectomy arthroscopy is nothing but a port which is placed into the knee joint and with the help of various instruments arthroscopic instruments you either remove the meniscus which is called meniscectomy or you repair with the sutures it is called meniscal repair but provided the tear should be in your red red zone right so that is about your meniscus so we have discussed the various tests here so one is your anterior drawers quick review posterior drawers so answer for yourself latchman's pivot shift macmurray's apple's grinding test varus test varus stress test and valgus stress test right so these all you know the answers that is acl and pcl and then it is latchman's is acl pivot is specific for acls macmurray's and apple's grinding is for meniscus so to diagnose this meniscus you have to go for meniscus and varus testus and valgus is for varus is for mcl and valgus is for lcl so these are the various tests which are present around the knee joint for diagnosing your internal derangement of knee that is idk right so internal derangement of knee so there are other uh, uh, tears which you can see is your bucket handle type of tear so extension of this continuously from the anterior horn to the posterior horn is called bucket handle tear and it requires a lot of sutures to be applied so you have to see whether it is radial tear or bucket handle tear and then you can repair it arthroscopically right so this is the uh, question and then after this question we'll go for a break So a patient presented with a pain in the shoulder with history of recurrent dislocation. On MRI, it was reported as Bankert's lesion. So the term, what does the term Bankert's mean? What is the term Bankert's mean in case of shoulder dislocation? As you all know, most common joint to dislocate is your shoulder dislocation. And most common dislocation in shoulder is your anterior dislocation, right?
so the answer for here it is so bankets is nothing but the stripping of the glenoid labrum with periosteum anterior inferiorly right so that is bankets so in case of shoulder dislocation so in case of shoulder dislocation the most common it is the most common joint to get dislocated and then the most common is nothing but your anterior dislocation what are the other types which are present anteriorly there are types that is infraclavicular subglenoid and infraglenoid right these are types and then there is posterior dislocation right so this posterior dislocation is commonly seen in case of electric shock and typically in patients who presents with epilepsy right so these two are anterior and posterior dislocations right and in case of complications of shoulder joint so in case of recurrent dislocations you can see two conditions which you have to remember recurrent dislocations two conditions what are those two conditions so one is your hill sacks lesion and the second one is your bankert's lesion right yeah seizures or epilepsy right hill sacks lesions and bankert's lesions so what is this bankert's lesions bankert's lesions is nothing but this is pathology related to your glenoid labrum so because of the recurrent dislocations because anterior is most common now the joint so this if you see this is the socket and this is the joint continuously there is a rubbing of this uh, humeral head over the glenoid labrum so there will be anteriorly inferiorly so this is your glenoid labrum and uh, if you think this is your labrum so this is your labrum so anterior inferior part is what is more prone so now here is your tear so if you think this is your labrum glenoid and this is your labrum right so anterior inferior area is the tear so that is your bankert's lesion bankert's lesion so you can again fix it fix this with your arthroscopic so shoulder arthroscopy is the procedure which is used for fixing this bankert's lesion and what is hill sacks anterior inferiorly right this is labrum so pathology is seen in labrum and what is hill sacks h for humeral head so there will be a defect on the posterior aspect posterior and that to superiorly or posterior laterally there will be a defect on the humeral head so that is called your hill sacks lesion so there are bankert's lesion and hill sacks lesion bankert's lesion is seen in your labral and your uh, hill sacks lesion is seen on the humeral head so this is your humeral head because of the constant rubbing of the glenoid labrum and the posterior surface of the humerus and here this is your posterior so this is the spine so hence it is posterior aspect and here you can see the lesion that is the hill sacks lesion on the humeral head so remember h for h hill sacks for humeral head and it is posteriorly because in anterior dislocation the posterior posterior is in contact with the uh, glenoid so there is a posterior depression or posterior erosion which is seen so that is your hill sacks lesion in case of bankers it is the labrum so sometimes the rubbing becomes so severe even the bony part also bony part of the labrum also comes along with it then that is called your bony bankers bony bankers lesion right so this is two types the bony bankers lesion and then it is your hill sacks lesion hill sacks lesion right so i have already told you the dugas test is used for your evaluating your shoulder dislocation right okay now let's break uh, let's take a quick break of 5 to 7 minutes or something like that and then we'll resume faster okay
So now let's resume the class. <clears throat> So I'm a visible, audible to you all again. So now this is the next question. We are uh, ready to answer this question now. So which of the following statement is true regarding septic arthritis on joint fluid analysis? So, which of the following statement is true regarding the septic arthritis on joint fluid analysis? So, why is joint fluid analysis is important? So, let's deal little about your joint fluid analysis, right? So, this could be a potential MCQ for your upcoming NEET exam, right? So, let's learn little in detail about it. So, what is your joint fluid? It is nothing but your synovial fluid, right? The synovial fluid which is present in the joint, it is rich in your hyaluronic acid and various other proteins and it is nothing but what is your joint joint fluid it is nothing but your plasma ultra filtrate right it is nothing but your plasma ultra filtrate the plasma gets filtered uh, along the capillaries and into the knee joint this is nothing but your synovial fluid so normal synovial fluid is usually is usually colorless and volume will be up to 4 ml and it is highly viscous right because of the presence of your hyaluronic acid it is highly viscous and only few WBC are present right and uh, the glucose is equal to your plasma levels the glucose and the uric acid which will be equal to your plasma levels right so this is the uh, few important points regarding your synovial fluid which is normal normal so normal it is colorless which is 4 ml in volume and it is highly viscous few amounts of wbc few amounts of wbc are present and then the glucose or the uric acid levels whatever are present are in par with your plasma levels or your serum levels right So, now why do you need to aspirate this joint fluid? This joint fluid aspiration is also called as arthrosynthesis. So, arthrosynthesis is nothing but your joint fluid aspiration. So, you, you will do this with your 18 gauge needle and you will put this needle into the joint and you will aspirate the fluid and you will send this fluid for the analysis. So, once you come with conclude the analysis, you can diagnose various pathological conditions based upon this simple simply invasive test that is a single needle prick will tell you the diagnosis rather than various other uh, sophisticated investigations so let's see few of the let's see few of them so what is your synovial fluid so this is your normal synovial fluid and this is your bloody so on on uh, inspection itself you can tell there is blood mixed with the synovial fluid and it is usually seen in a traumatic conditions right traumatic conditions and this is your knee joint and this is your synovial capsule inside the capsule is your synovium and this synovium will secrete the synovial fluid and this fluid is important for your lubrication of the joints and it will reduce the friction between the joints hence hence in osteoarthritis because of the decrease of this particular fluid it will result in the friction and it will cause erosions of the both articulating surfaces resulting in a condition called osteoarthritis so one of the important treatment in osteoarthritis is visco supplementation so what is this visco supplementation it means that you will give substances which are rich in your hyaluronic acid substances which are rich in hyaluronic acid are injected just to increase the lubrication of the joint and prevent further degradation of this joint that is osteoarthritis 
arthritis right so where are this few important conditions where the examination of synovial fluid is important so in case of septic conditions so whenever you take this fluid it will be cloudy so why cloudy because of presence of n number of white cells that is more than 50000 white cells will be present so more than 50000 wbc cells are present and the bacteriology for culture will be positive that will indicate your culture that will indicate your you are treating the septic arthritis in relation with your esr and elevated esr and elevated crp right there will be no crystals present and it will be very low on viscous right so this is half your uh, diagnosis of septic arthritis is made and you can even send it for gram staining also right so in case of septic it will be appear as cloudy will be low viscous and it will be having very huge amount of white cells and preferably if it is bacterial they will be rich in polymorphonuclear that is neutrophils pmns cells are very high right and then if it is a normal as i have already told you normal it is colorless appearance it is high viscous very moderate amount of that is less than 200 cells and there are no crystals and usually it is negative and negative right if it is osteoarthritis i have already told you this is non-inflammatory so you can also deal it as non-inflammatory condition and this is the inflammatory condition so in case of inflammatory condition the cells will be around somewhere around 2000 WBC will be increased because of the inflammation WBC will be increased right that is how because of increase in the cells increase in the cells the viscosity also will be low right and then here this could be somewhere about osteoarthritis the inflammatory it could be non-inflammatory or osteoarthritis the viscosity still can be high and still it is yellow color or colorless or crystal here here it will become yellow and it will be turbid and crystal induced also it will be turbid or cloudy because of the presence of crystals again it is low in viscous so the crystals will be positive there are two conditions which you have to remember one is gout and one is another one is your pseudo gout right so gouty arthropathy and pseudo gout arthropathy so what is gout the crystals here is your urate crystal so increase in your uric acid as i've already told you the glucose and the uric acid are in par with your plasma level so with high uric acid levels in the blood they get uh, get get deposited in the joint and they form crystals so in case of crystals in case of gouty arthritis there are urate crystals urate crystals and the typical features of these crystals are there are monosodium urate crystals and they are negatively bifringent negatively bifringent what does this mean it means based upon the polarized light they might look in different shapes in different angles so that is negatively bifringent green color which are negatively bifringent is your crystal uh, that is your urate crystal so monosodium crystals and then this is cppd pyrophosphate crystals deposition of your sodium phosphate pyrophosphate crystals in the negative in the joint is called and these are positively bifringent right so this is your synovial fluid analysis so here also the cells will be less than 200 in case of osteoarthritis there will be no crystals and their normal by the glucose levels are normal but in case of septic the the glucose levels are low the sugars are low comparatively to that of your plasma so because the bacteria feeds on this glucose and then the sugar levels become low so this is about your synovial fluid analysis so by this analysis you came to know there could be a gouty arthritis or pseudo gout present or it could be a septic arthritis it could be an inflammatory disease or it could be a osteoarthritis right so that is about your synovial fluid analysis so next question quickly identify the diagnosis of this x-ray so this is your x-ray on your screen and what is this condition on the x-ray so if you can read the x-ray this is the x-ray of knee joint 
and if you can see the joint space is decreased the joint space whatever is present it is decreased and there is a formation of osteophytes at the end and mild amount of sclerosis you can see over the joint lines is a condition of osteoarthritis right so where there is a joint space narrowing so one thing you have to remember and sometimes even if it is great for osteoarthritis it will have a deformity so this could be a varus deformity or a valgus deformity which is present and usually in case of osteoarthritis it is the varus deformity in because the medial compartment the medial compartment is the weight bearing area so that is involved in osteoarthritis so hence it will go result in varus hence it will result in varus but in case of inflammatory conditions in case of inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis in case of rheumatoid arthritis there will be involvement of lateral compartment lateral compartment hence it can have even have valgus deformity or there is one more important condition called wind swept deformity so what is this wind swept deformity What is this wind swept deformity? So, wind swept deformity is nothing but one knee in valgus, another knee in varus. So, if you have two knees, so one will be in varus and one more knee in valgus, that is called wind swept deformity. So, it is classical of it is classical of your rheumatoid arthritis, right? It is classical of your rheumatoid arthritis. So, that is about your uh, uh, arthritis around the knee joint. So, there are two types. You have to usually differentiate between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. When it comes to osteoarthritis, usually it is seen in very old age. Like it is seen in elderly females or males in elderly population because it is a disease of degeneration. So, usually it is wear and tear mechanism should happen along the joint and that will result in degenerative arthritis. But in case of inflammatory arthritis, it is seen in young females. Young females where because of the antigens, the antibodies which are produced uh, against your own antigen will result in the inflammation of the joint which is called your uh, rheumatoid arthritis right so in case of osteoarthritis is nothing but wear and tear mechanism should happen so because the medial compartment is taking more forces the medial compartment is damaged first that will result in a deformity called varus and then in rheumatoid arthritis the lateral compartment can also be involved and result in valgus there is one more condition called wind swept where one knee in varus another knee in valgus it is classical of your rheumatoid arthritis now coming to the answer of this so what will happen in this so, I have already told you the proteoglycans are important. So, the first, the first change observed in pathogenesis of osteoarthritis is, osteoarthritis is your increase in water content and there will be depletion of proteoglycans. Usually, students tend to think that there will be a decrease in water content and increase in proteoglycans, but there will be an increase in water content and depletion of proteoglycans. Proteoglycans are mainly useful for making the, vis where making the synovial fluid viscous, right? So, hence, this is depletion of proteoglycans. Right. So, that is of osteoarthritis. Here I have given in detail. So, you can see the deformity. There is completely, there is a completely uh, loss of the joint space and this is the point where the deformities occur. So, if you can see there is a varus deformity bending. Okay. This is also a varus deformity. So, this is almost a grade for osteoarthritis. Right. So, that is how you have to comment. So, first you will see narrowing, joint space narrowing and then you will see osteophytes that is nothing but sclerosis, sclerosis and then you will see a deformity and sometimes with the sclerosis you can also see the subchondral cyst. So, that is the osteoarthritis. So, next question. So, identify the wrong match. So, based upon type of number of vertebrae affected. So, this is in case of uh, a deformity of spine. So, this is question based on deformity of the spine. They based on number of the vertebrae affected, you can name them. So, based on this, uh, it could be knuckle, gibbous, kyphosis. So, it could, there are two types of kyphosis, that angular kyphosis and rounded kyphosis, right? 
okay if you are confused between valgus and varus just remember varus so varus what is varus the distal the distal part will come closer the distal and the distal will come towards midline is varus and if the distal distal part goes away from the midline it is valgus right So always deformity is described in terms of your distal fragment or distal part. So if the distal part is towards the midline, it is varus. So that is bow legs. If the distal part is away from the midline, it is valgus. So knock knees. Right? So this type of deformity. So knuckle and gibbous or angular kyphosis. So you, I have already told you that this sideward bending of spine. Sideward bending of spine is called scoliosis right similarly the forward bending forward bending of spine is called kyphosis right so these two important terms so kyphosis and scoliosis s for s so sideward bending is scoliosis and forward bending is kyphosis right so this is the kyphosis so depending upon the number of vertebrae so you can divide them into knuckle right then gibbous then angular kyphosis and then rounded kyphosis right so whenever there is involvement of one vertebra it is called knuckle involvement of two vertebra it is called gibbous more than three is called kyphus in that if it is three it is angular kyphosis and more than three it is rounded kyphosis so this is the kyphosis so this is the forward bending of the spine which is protruding so thus it is present as gibbous so this you call it as gibbous so this elevation of the spine over back is called your gibbous right this is gibbous and then on the mri you sh you will see this so involvement of vertebra involvement of the vertebra then it will result in bending of the spine forward bending of the spine so this will result in this deformity right so knuckle one vertebra is involved it is called knuckle two vertebra if it is involved it is called gibbous three or more is kyphosis if it is only three or four it is angular kyphosis or more than five it is rounded kyphosis right so the answer here would be gibbous so gibbous is only involvement of two vertebrae if two vertebrae are involved it is gibbous so one is knuckle three or four is angular more than four is rounded kyphosis so these are some of the important straight answers which if you remember you can answer it easily right so next question so that is about scoliosis and we have covered scoliosis we have covered kyphosis so kyphosis also it is forward bending mostly kyphosis is seen in osteoporosis osteoporosis it is kyphosis because there will be fractures resulting in this forward bending the height of the vertebra is decreased in case of kyphosis right so let's let's deal with one more important topic so which of the following is correct regarding ankylosing spondylitis so which of the following conditions i mean like what which one is correct according to you in terms of ankylosing spondylitis so this is one of the another most important topic in view with your upcoming neat pg right so hope you are all following the class and uh, here we'll we are dealing now with the ankylosing spondylitis so i will write only few important points about it so you can have a quick review so it is a chronic inflammatory condition so it is a chronic inflammatory condition most commonly seen in this is important most commonly seen in young males so most commonly seen in young males and it is hla b27 related disorder so if you test for hla b27 it would be positive in patients with ankylosing spondylitis so in case of ankylosing spondylitis what is the system which is most commonly affected is your axial skeleton right so axial skeleton is most commonly affected leaving your appendix appendicular skeleton so what is axial and what is appendicular skeleton for 
people who doesn't know axial skeleton is a straight so it is your spine your sacroiliac joints form your axial skeleton appendicular or your limbs so upper limb and lower limb will form your appendicular skeleton right so this is a disease of axial skeleton the most common joint which is involved in axial skeleton is this you have to remember this is sacroiliac joint so si joint is most commonly involved in case of ankylosing spondylitis right it is seen in young males and it is hla b27 positive and usually the patient complains with complains with morning stiffness so as soon as patient wakes up from the bed he will have the stiffness of the spine morning stiffness of the spine so once this sacroiliac joints are involved then it will affect the lumbar spine so there will be fusion of the lumbar spine in later part of the disease which is called as important question bamboo spine bamboo spine so this is important in in terms of exam bamboo spine and this is one more important finding is there will be formation of syndesmophytes what are the syndesmophytes you know what are osteophytes these are extra growth which are seen on the bone are osteophytes in case of spine these are called syndesmophytes because because in vertebra if this is your vertebral column these osteophytes are formed here and they fuse the spine so this is called syn syn is nothing but fusion so this is your syn desmophytes and will form a one spine which cannot flex or extend uh, just a straight spine hence it is called your bamboo spine right bamboo spine and the appearance of the syn desmophytes and its and its prediction to involve the sacroiliac joint in young males should think of in terms of ankylosing spondylitis so bilateral yeah very good it is bilateral sacroiliitis okay now based on this information i think uh, you can answer this question so it has a strong association with hla b27 genetic marker so a very good so hla b27 genetic marker right and there are no extra articular manifestation is also wrong because in case of ankylosing spondylitis another important feature is it is involved with extra articular manifestation so what are those extra articular manifestation it will result in uveitis in case of i and it can involve pulmonary complications cardiovascular complications right such as iot iota can be involved so and neurological complications right so there are various other systems which are also involved in ankylosing spondylitis and there are extra mani extra articular manifestations which are present so how do you treat this condition treatment is again conservative that is nsaids and you advise for physiotherapy and if it is still disabling then you go for osteotomy osteotomy and correction of the deformity right so that is the treatment so the important things you have to remember is it is a chronic inflammatory condition and it is seen in young males it is associated with hla b27 it is the, the common symptoms are morning stiffness that is in presence of bamboo spine right and the uh, prediction to involve the sacroiliitis right so now you can see this vertebra here so usually what i have told you here before this is called the syndesmophytes so the fusion of osteophytes on the x-ray are called syndesmophytes and this will result in bamboo spine so if you see the bamboo it is exactly like the bamboo right so this is called the bamboo spine and one more condition you can see is the squaring of vertebrae seen in squaring of vertebrae right it is seen in case of ankylosing spondylitis okay and one more interesting feature you can see here so they have already told you this is squaring which you can see the squaring of vertebrae then there is syndesmophyte and these are shiny corners which are present which are not that specific for ankylosing spondylitis but this is something which is specific for ankylosing spondylitis the ossification of the ligament which will result ossification of the ligament longitudinal ligament which is present there and it will result in a formation called 
the dagger spine right for dagger is nothing but a knife so dagger sign on spine is indication of what indication of which abnormality indication of ankylosing spondylitis right so that is that completes the ankylosing spondylitis so what are the important points so squaring of vertebrae the presence of syndesmophytes which fuse together from the bamboo spine and the dagger spine dagger signs okay and squaring of vertebra picture frame vertebra is seen in picture frame vertebra so the various vertebras features we can see the cord or fish vertebrae right picture frame vertebrae Pic picture frame vertebrae quadroid appearance of vertebrae you have learned all this right uh, squaring of vertebrae and then you have winking oval sign right winking oval sign so these are some of the conditions seen in seen in the vertebral column vertebral column right so answer answer these all and post it in telegram i will not tell you the answer search for the answers and post it in the telegram i will confirm the answers there okay now let's go to the next next question which of the following are not the radiological features of osteosarcoma? So, osteosarcoma is already dealt and I think you can answer this question without any difficulty. So, the answer for this is, so <clears throat> two important conditions for osteosarcoma. So, if you have followed the class, already we know the osteosarcoma is osteoid forming tumor. It is one of the most common malignant tumor of bone occurs in the second decade and the radiological features include two important conditions so one is your cordman's triangle this cordman's triangle is nothing but a periosteal reaction and the second one is your sun ray appearance so based upon this you can answer the question so lot of newborn formation is correct cordman's triangle is correct sun ray appearance is correct so the answer would be your so bubble appearance so bubble appearance is seen in case of giant cell tumor so giant cell tumor why this is so bubble so bubble because of the septa so if you think this is your tibia and there is a formation of tumor so that is your uh, epiphyseal region and there will be thin septa so this will give appearance as a soap bubble but in case of the sun ray appearance so why it is called sun ray appearance because of the formation of osteoid formation of osteoid along the blood vessels along the blood vessels so these blood vessels there will be osteoid formation and hence gives rise to your these are something like this something like this it is nothing but your sun ray appearance for osteosarcoma right so this is so let's learn in detail about the periosteal reaction hence the question has come from periosteal reactions let's learn about periosteal reaction so what is periosteal reaction so what is periosteum so periosteum is nothing but a covering over the bone it consists of two outer fibrous layer and inner cambium layer so two important layers which are present in the periosteum so it is outer fibrous layer and inner cambium layer what is important for us is inner cambium layer because it is osteogenic it is osteogenic it consists of osteoprogenitor cells so whenever this periosteum is irritated so something is causing irritation to this periosteum it will result in formation of bone because it consists of progenitor cell that is what it can do that is what it is meant for so it will result in formation of the bone so this tumor when comes and irritates the periosteum it will result in a reaction that is called periosteal reaction 
so based upon this periostal reaction so why it is important for us so based upon this periostal reaction you can lead this into a diagnosis so you can come to a conclusion so based upon this reaction so each tumor behave differently right so each tumor is peculiar so each tumor is different so in this condition so whenever you see an x-ray and you see a particular type of periostal reaction then you can simply say the diagnosis right it will helpful for your diagnosis so there are few common periostal reactions so they could be solid periostal reaction there is complete formation of the bone it is usually seen in now you have to answer it is seen in osteoid osteoma right it is solid so it is benign usually when the periostal reaction is solid it is benign condition lamellated so it is even ewing's sarcoma onion peel appearance that is lamellated periostal reaction this is speculated or hair on end appearance so it is less aggressive as it is already mentioned here and then this is your cordman's triangle where if this is the bone if this is the bone the periosteal reaction because of the tumor this periosteum will get lifted off from the bone and this forms a triangle like shape here so this is the triangle this this, this is the triangle so hence it is called the Codman's triangle. So, Codman is the one who has identified it. So, hence it is called Codman's triangle. In case of onion peel appearance, so in case of Ewing sarcoma, it is onion peel appearance. Sorry, sorry, it is here, this one. So, it is onion peel appearance. Right? So, that is the periosteal reaction, that is the importance of the periosteal reactions. So, some of the few important periosteal reactions I have mentioned here. So, if you see, so first one is uh, something like infection, it is like moth-eaten appearance. So, this is typically called moth-eaten appearance and if you see here, there is a dead bone, dead bone. What is this dead bone called as? This is important, again in terms of your entrance. So, dead bone which is sclerotic covered by an area of lucency. So, why it is dead, why it is sclerotic, usually, usually when there is a bone, it is sclerotic means it is healthy only, no. So, usually bone is white in color. So, here it is also white in color, but why are you telling it is a dead bone? That should be your question. So, why it, I am calling it as dead bone? And there is a specific term given to this. So, why it is called dead bone? Yeah, it is called sequestrum, right? So, why it is called, uh, why it is dense and sclerotic? So, usually dead bone should be lytic somewhere or it should be lighter than the bone. Why this is sclerotic? It means that the resorption is not happening. What is the sign of living of a bone? It should be resorbed. If you remember bone remodeling, what I told you in that particular question, bone remodeling is nothing but bone resorption and then bone formation. In case of dead bone, because there is no vascular supply, there is no resorption. But hence, it appears whiter, more dense than the surrounding bone. Hence, it is dense sclerotic bone, which is called sequestrum. Even though it is white in color, you still say it is a dead bone, right? And the name given to this is the sequestrum. So, this is a dead bone. What is involucrum? Involucrum is nothing but your new bone which is formed so i have already told you whenever you irritate the periosteum it will result in new bone formation because that is what it can do right that is what it can do so that is why the new bone formation is called involucrum and then what is cloaca the openings openings of the bone openings on the bone are called cloaca so all these are the features of which condition these are the features of your chronic osteomyelitis so important topic chronic osteomyelitis what is chronic osteomyelitis infection of bone and 
bone marrow so itis is inflammation mylas is marrow osteo is bone so infection of bone and bone marrow will result in this particular condition so the blood supply is cut off and this will result in a dead bone which is present here this is the sequestrum this is all the periosteal reaction which is happening here this is called involucrum right and then this is hair on end appearance it is seen in tumorous conditions the hair on end appearance and this is your see if you see carefully this is the osteosarcoma osteosarcoma and if you see there is a lift off of periosteum this is indicative of cordman's triangle we have already discussed the cordman's triangle so lifting up of periosteum from the bone is nothing but your cordman's triangle and then what is this this is nothing but your sun ray appearance right so completely there are uh, formed of the it is like the spicules on the both sides and they are like your this is sun ray so this is osteosarcoma and now this is solid reaction so on the x-ray this is look like this and the indication or the diagnosis would be osteoid osteoma as already told you osteoid osteoma is a benign tumor which is a bone forming tumor right so bone is formed in this way so osteoid osteoma it is a solid periosteal reaction and then this is one more periosteal reaction just to know what is periosteum so this is periosteum and its reaction so there are formation of new bone that is periosteal reactions right so that is the topic of periosteal reactions and your diagnosis for tumor so based upon this periosteal reaction based upon the age of the patient you might come to a conclusion that is come to a diagnosis of that particular condition right so next question let's move on to next question so now this question is dealing with the complication of fractures right so let's read the question a 15 year old male presented with symptoms of shortness of breath history of femur fixation post-operative day one so there is a history of femur fixation and he is in his post-operative day one now he is presenting with symptoms of shortness of breath on examination petechiae are noted the probable diagnosis would be so you have to always learn about complications of fracture so if you are dealing with one condition you have to always learn the complications of that condition so we are learning about complications of fracture so one of the most important complication of fracture is your fat embolism so let's learn about fat embolism right so what is fat embolism it is mostly seen in condition called femur shaft fractures and this is also usually seen in young males with femur shaft fracture that is what you have to remember about this condition right so whenever the bone is fractured so the bone is fractured it will result in escape of fat globules because you have to remember the fact that you have to remember the fact that adult marrow consists of fat right it is not about ma uh, marrow marrow is nothing but it consists of fat right and um, this fat globules get escaped during the femur shaft and this will result in two conditions so it may it may cause vasculitis of the capillaries or it might result in embolism which is cause the obstruction of the pulmonary capillaries obstruction of the pulmonary capillaries right obstruction of the pulmonary capillary these are two important pathologies which you can explain the fat embolism and once the fat embolism is there the patient presents with symptoms are very important in fat embolism so it presents with shortness of breath so the spo2 levels fall so spo2 will drop suddenly and then there is formation of petechiae and then there is neurological symptoms that is patients presents with confusion so if the femur if you have 
if you have uh, any patient you know you have operated or presenting with femur shaft and you have two these two complaints it is to uh, the neurological symptoms and then uh, pulmonary symptoms so you have to immediately think of your fat embolism and petechiae is almost diagnosis of fat embolism in case of femur shaft fracture right how do you diagnose it diagnosis of femur shaft is mainly by your decrease in spo2 levels and presence of fat globules in case of sputum and urine sputum and urine the fat globules are present in sputum and urine and the d dimer is always there for you to tell and ultimately your pulmonary angiography to rule out other conditions like pulmonary embolism so that is about your complications of fat embolism which is very and uh, somebody has mentioned it very correctly so usually this femur shaft and this fat embolism is present up to 1 to 5 days it is not this 24 to 48 hours so 1 to 5 days that is why whenever a patient arrives with femur shaft you have to operate it immediately immediately or after 48 hours so that is the time you give for the settlement of that fracture and that is how the damage control orthopedics has evolved so you have to anticipate if it is a young male very young male 20 years old coming with femur shaft and uh, immediate fixation you have done and if you have done immediate fixation you have to observe the patient for this particular symptoms and if you are not fixing it you have to again be careful and explain them about this fat embolism syndrome right and uh, this fat embolism syndrome treatment is again based upon the condition so conservative treatment so first you have to treat him according to the symptoms and one thing you have to remember is heparin heparinization should be done Okay, that is what is important, heparinization. That is the treatment of fat embolism syndrome. So, now I think you can answer. A 15 year old male presented with shortness of breath, SOB is present, petechiae is present and the probable diagnosis would be fat embolism. You should also put in mind that sometimes this thromboembolism also might be there. But before that, before that you have to see the see, uh, various other conditions should be ruled out and then you have to take the patient for surgery. And it is definitely not myocardial infarction and uh, NSAID induced bronchial asthma. Even though it is shortness of breath because of presence of petechiae, we have come to the conclusion of it could be probably of fat, fat embolism and the most important one is the, there is a history of fracture femur fixation. Okay. So, that is the fat embolism syndrome. So, we are going to next question. So, what are other complications of fracture? So, let us deal little about other complications of fracture because I have not covered in the question. So, fat embolism is one of the thing and one more important thing of complication of fractures is non-union. So, I have already explained what is non-union and malunion and then there could be myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans is one more complication of fracture fixation and they could be damage to vessels and nerves damage to vessels and nerves so let's learn about non-union so non-union is mostly commonly seen in ic fracture and scaphoid scaphoid bone these two are very much prone to non-union malunion usually mainly seen in distal radius fracture which will result in deformity and your supracondylar fracture of humerus of humerus right that is malunion so damage to vessels or nerve because of the presence of that particular fracture the particular fragments few vessels are vulnerable to damage like in case of supracondylar fracture supracondylar humerus fracture the most important artery is the brachial artery so brachial artery is a damage and in case of uh, dislocation of uh, knee joint dislocation of knee joint the artery which is most vulnerable is your popliteal artery right so likewise again in your supracondylar fracture humerus the nerve is mostly the anterior interosseous nerve or the median nerve which is 
more uh, prone to damage and in case of fibula neck fractures the deep peroneal nerve is at risk so these are certain fracture complications so now what is myositis ossificans so here if you see the myositis ossificans as the name suggests where the muscle cells will form the bone so the muscle fibers are stimulated by a process of massaging right so these osteopaths so whenever there is a fracture usually there are ortho osteopaths that is non surgeons like the who are just dealing the fractures with massages or various other uh, 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 local uh, treatments which they are using they will do massage over that particular joint and this os myositis ossificans is mainly seen in elbow joint most common joint to prone for myositis ossificans is elbow joint followed by your hip joint so here whenever there is a fracture of the elbow or fracture around the elbow and usually in 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 um, uh, places like india uh, india so in places like india where financial issues are the priority for treating of a fracture rather than your biology so uh, here the patients they will take the uh, whoever the patient they will they will take the patients to the osteopath the local osteopath he will do a lot of massages and put lot of you know other uh, uh, unusual treatments will be given to that particular fracture for like the elbow is more prone to massages so they will massage it with some oil or something and this massaging will stimulate the muscle around the elbow the most common muscle is your brachialis so this is also important uh, bit for pg so brachialis so this muscles get stimulated and it will produce bone so this is called myositis ossificans so muscle fiber is ossifying and this will hinder hinder the movements in the elbow joint so the elbow cannot be flexed or extended it will remain in that flexion posture because of the muscles and on anterior aspect there will be bone so it cannot flex right so this will result in deformity the flexion deformity of the elbow then again you have to remove that myositis ossificans that is the whatever the bone is obstructing the movement you have to remove that bone by your surgery similarly hip is also involved in the hip joint it is a gluteus muscles which gets ossified right so this is some of the important uh, complications of the fracture so there could be non union most commonly non unions are seen in ic fracture and scaphoid the most common reason would be for scaphoid it is the blood supply right so this completes the topic of complications of fracture so the next one a female patient of age 27 years recently delivered presented recently delivered a baby okay presented with symptoms of tingling and numbness of lateral three fingers on eds found to have carpal tunnel syndrome which of the muscle is paired in this condition so here they are testing with two conditions right first you have to tell the diagnosis of that condition and which nerve is compressed in that particular condition and then what is the nerve supply so this is some somewhat like integrated question so already they have given the clue as carpal tunnel syndrome here so if it is a carpal tunnel syndrome what is the nerve which is involved so the nerve which is involved is your median nerve so the median nerve is present in the center of the carpal tunnel and that it gets compressed usually in cases of uh, uh, distal radius fracture or it could be seen in patients with hypothyroidism pregnancy condition so here the patient is post pregnancy so because of the edema uh, because of the edema the compartment uh, uh, the whatever the tunnel is there that is uh, filled with the fluid and it compresses the median nerve resulting in tingling of this lateral three fingers right so median nerve is compressed so what is the nerve supply so what is the muscles what are all the muscles which are supplied by your median nerve is the question right so median nerve so in that case let's deal with the nerves of upper limb it will be a quick review don't worry so there are three nerves so first is your radial nerve 
नेक्स्ट इज योर अलनार नर्व एंड नेक्स्ट इज योर मीडियन नर्व राइट मीडियन नर्व सो रेडियल नर्व इज नथिंग बट इट्स अप्लाइज द मजल्स ऑफ एक्सटेंशन सो सिंपली रिमेंबर ऑल द मजल्स ऑफ एक्सटेंशन सो योर एक्सटेंसर कार्पी रेडियल इज लॉन्गर्स ब्रे ऑल दोज एक्सटेंसर डिजिटोरियम ऑल द एक्सटेंसर्स इफ द नेम इज एक्सटेंसर बिफोर एनी मजल इट इज अप्लाइड बाई रेडियल नर्व विदाउट एनी डाउट राइट एंड देर आर नो स्पेसिफिक टेस्ट फॉर रेडियल नर्व दैट इज द most fascinating point of the radial nerve right so there are no tests but one important conditions you have to remember is your wrist drop whenever there is a radial nerve palsy so what is the most common condition where you see the radial nerve palsy in wrist drop that condition is called as your saturday nerve palsy so what is saturday nerve palsy where Uh, so this is saturday nerve palsy i think uh, you know better so whenever a patient is completely drunk on the saturday night and uh, putting his limb on this abducted position and sleeps overnight completely this will result in neuropraxia of the radial nerve so now the radial nerve it is getting compressed in the groove and it will produce the wrist drop a condition called as wrist drop right so that is the radial nerve supply all the muscles which are involved in extension of the limb upper limb and then this is ulnar nerve so what is ulnar nerve it is called the musician's nerve musician's nerve so what is this musician's nerve that means it supplies the intrinsic muscles of hand now the question arises what are the intrinsic muscles of hand so they are your lumbricals everybody along with me lumbricals and then there are your dorsal interossei palmar interossei and your thenar muscles and your hypothenar muscles right so these are all supplied by your so these are your intrinsic muscles of your hand they are not supplied by the ulnar nerve these are intrinsic muscles of the hand so lumbricals dorsal interossei palmar interossei thenar and hypothenar right so what are all supplied by the ulnar nerve so the lumbricals so third and fourth so ulnar nerve is usually present on your ulnar aspect so it could be a third and fourth and it will supply dorsal interossei palmar interossei and your hypothenar muscles so here the median nerve immediately you can write the medial nerve supplies your thenar muscles and the first and second lumbricals along with your flexors of your upper limb all the flexor right from your flexor carpi radialis to your flexor carpi ulnaris in between there are many flexors uh, though these are supplied by your median nerve right so now coming to the question so here you have to memorize what are thenar muscles and hypothenar muscles here is a small catch in median nerve so if somebody can name all the thenar muscles so let's do it together flexor pollicis brevis right it is supplied by ulnar nerve abductor pollicis brevis opensis pollicis and then your adductor pollicis right so these are your hypothenar muscles so these are your hypothenar muscles so important point to remember is your adductor pollicis is not supplied by your median nerve it is supplied by your ulnar nerve so this is what is important so always the exceptions are important right so that is why you have to always be unique you have to have an exception right if you are you are if you are away <clears throat> if you are unique from the crowd then you are a exception right then you will be remembered by everyone so here the adductor pollicis is remembered because of it is exception so the median nerve supplies all the thenar muscles except adductor pollicis and hence the answer of this question would be adductor 
lipolysis so even in case of carpal tunnel syndrome all the muscles are damaged all the muscles are involved except your adductor pollicis because adductor pollicis is supplied by your ulnar nerve right so this is this completes the uh, your uh, nerve supply of your upper limb so what are the various tests that also will complete here so for median nerve one of the important test is your pointing index pointing index and then is your ok sign that is kilonovin sign or ok sign right and for ulnar nerve you have your card test for testing the interosseous you have your igawa test and the book test and for median nerve you have your pen test right so these are various tests by which we are testing the upper uh, nerves of the upper limb so you can read them in great detail it is all easy so card test is between your abductors you will put the card in between and try to pull it so if your interosseous are working it will hold it will hold your card and it will not allow it right and then igawa is again your testing for your uh, interosseous right and then what is the book test book test is if you hold the book you will put the adductor pollicis and then adductor pollicis you put the adductor pollicis and will then you, you will control the book but if your adductor pollicis is damaged then you use the flexor pollicis the flexor pollicis is used this usage of the flexor pollicis is given one more name called fromen's sign so this is your fromen's sign and what is the pen test pen test is nothing but the pen is held here and it is uh, you are asked to touch with your uh, thumb this is for median nerve again so this is your pen test and ok or kilo nerve in sign is the test for your anterior interosseous nerve you are able to do this this is your anterior interosseous nerve is intact it is also called kilo nerve in sign it is also called your ok sign and what is this this is your Oshner clasp deformity where you try to clasp and then you will have this pointing index so pointing index so all will flex except this so this is also indicative of your median pointing index right so these are the various tests which you can learn and remember memorize and reproduce in your exam right next question next question is joint spade in rheumatoid arthritis so what is rheumatoid arthritis it is again a inflammatory condition what does that mean means it is usually seen in younger females okay it is somewhat hereditary and the self antigens will produce antibodies and these antibodies will destruct the joint resulting in joint inflammation so joint inflammation and in rheumatoid arthritis it is polyarthritis or polyarthralgia so multiple joints are involved and they should be at least the involvement of hand joints one or two hand joints should be involved and in that case of hand joints the most common one involved would be your m c p and your p i p and then comes your wrist joint right but remember in rheumatoid the d i p is spared so if it is spared in rheumatoid it is involved in some other condition what is that condition can anybody tell me where the d i p is involved d i p is involved in psoriasis a condition a skin condition where psoriasis is seen it is dip so what is the deformity or radiological you will see pencil cup deformity right on the x-rays and dips are involved in case of psoriasis in case of rheumatoid arthritis dip is paid most common is MCP. 
so the answer would be dip right so rheumatoid uh, how do you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis patients will present with polyarthritis and uh, one more important thing is it is bilaterally symmetrical so symmetrically seen in both the joints it is bilaterally symmetrical and polyarthritis it is usually associated with morning stiffness right morning stiffness uh, usually why morning stiffness is night completely they are at rest now the inflammation process will occur and by the morning the joints become swollen and this is called the morning stiffness patient will complain about swellings as the day passes the swelling decreases the pain decreases but this is contrary to osteoarthritis where by the end of the day patient complains of pain in the joint because osteoarthritis is a wear and tear mechanism so you use the joint it will cause the pain you give rest to joint it will not cause the pain but inflammation is not like that if you rest it will cause more pain because the inflammation process is occurring if you move the joints continuously you are you are uh, uh, probably hindering the process of the inflammation so patient present with morning stiffness and the hand joint should be involved for this diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis then they will be raised ra factor raised esr all the inflammatory parameters are raised and on the x-ray you see juxta articular osteoporosis that is osteopenia first right so these are the various uh, uh, important points regarding your rheumatoid arthritis right and then in case of knee joint in case of knee joint it is the lateral compartment is also involved and will result in valgus deformity so this is about your uh, rheumatoid arthritis so how do you treat it so treatment is with dmard this that is disease modifying rheumatoid arthritic uh, drugs right and then our favorite nsids nsids also are used so nsids are used and next if it is causing more problem with the joint uh, because the synovium is at fault you can go with synovectomy and if joints are more prone you can go for osteotomy and ultimately patients land up in arthroplasty that means replacements of joint that is in case of larger joint hip and knee hip and knee so that is the treatment you always start with dmrds and then you have to nsids and then you are you will put them on the low dose steroids also and then if if the synovium is more problematic you can go for synovectomy and if the joints are involved you can go for to some extent you can go for osteotomies and then the ultimately they will land up in arthroplasty that is replacement so larger joints are usually undergoing replacement that is hip replacement and the knee replacement so that is the treatment of your uh, rheumatoid arthritis so let's now discuss about the deformities in rheumatoid arthritis so as i've already mentioned the deformities of hand are important for the diagnosis of rheumatoid so typically a patient with severe rheumatoid arthritis over the years the hands will be like this so the mcp joints are involved here which is causing the drifts and uh, this here also it is drift and in wrist also there is some amount of uh, deformity which is present and typical deformities which you have to learn is your swan neck deformity and botaneous deformity so what is swan neck deformity in swan neck deformity there will be flexion of dip so this is the swan neck deformity so flexion of dip extension of pip flexion of dip and extension of pip so this pip goes into hyperextension and this causes the swan neck deformity so what is botaneous botaneous is like this so botaneous is flexion of pip right flexion of pip and hyperextension of dip so that is how you have to remember the swan neck deformity and botaneous deformity so if you see this is swan neck right so you can easily remember right this is swan neck looking like swan neck at least and then this is the involvement of dip so when you flex at the dip only you are getting the swan neck right so flexion of dip so opposite will be extension of pip so botaneous is exactly opposite you cause extension <coughs> 
and uh, flexion of PIP and extension of DIP. A lot of PIP and DIP. So that is why I have put this diagram. It is very clear for you, right? So here, swan neck, flexion of DIP, botaniers, flexion of PIP. So that is all we have to remember. So flexion at PIP is botaneous, flexion of DIP is swan neck deformity, right? The opposite is true for your vice versa types. And what is the pathology is involved is mainly the pathology is not because of the, some muscle is pulling and all. It is because of the extensor tendons. They will be slip of the extensor tendons. They will be slip of the uh, volar plates which are present. So the extensor mechanism will be disturbed. Hence, it results in flexion. So that are the uh, various deformities. So your botanius, van neck, ulna, drift, all these deformities are seen in your rheumatoid arthritis. Right? Next. This is one of the easy question. Usually you can answer. Uh, so Rajendra, which joints are most commonly get affected in osteoarthritis is number one joint which gets affected in osteoarthritis, your knee joint. Okay. That is where most of the orthopedic surgeons are thriving. So knee joint coming to replacements is the most common joint. And osteoarthritis can occur in any other joint because of this wear and tear mechanism is the pathology. So you use all the joints. So all are involved but most common joint is your knee joint. Then comes your hip joint. Okay. So whenever there is a pathology in occurring in that particular joint. Sir, for example, if the patient is having ankle fractures over a period of time because of the alteration in the biomechanics after the fixation surgically or the conservatively bone healing so this will result invariably into osteoarthritis so there are all the joints can invariably result in osteoarthritis so this question a patient of age 45 years presented with x-ray as shown what would be the treatment of choice so here the question is about your fracture neck of femur if you can evaluate so this is the fracture neck. So very subtle fracture. It is almost like your valgus impacted fracture, right? So a faint fracture line which is seen here. And such fracture, if the patient's age is uh, in favor, that is 45 years is, okay, good age, favor of what? Favor of? So I see fractures. I see fractures treatment part IC fractures so let us classify IC fractures huh, your favorite anatomical classification very easy so it is divided into subcapital trans cervical and basic cervical right so what is all this so if you see the femur head if it is here it is subcapital Trans cervical and then basic cervical. Wait, 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 sorry. So, this is trans cervical and this is basic cervical, this is subcapital, right? And then Powell's classification. What is Powell's classification? So, the fracture pattern making an angle with the horizontal. So, if this is your horizontal, the fracture pattern. So, if this is your femoral head and there is a fracture. In the neck and its substance and angle so usually the fracture will be like this sorry so if this is your femoral head this is your neck and the fracture is like this so this is the horizontal line and this is the fracture line so to the horizontal whatever the fracture line you are making it, this is the angle so if this angle is less that means the fracture is stable as the angle increases that means the fracture is becoming more vertical whenever i say the word more vertical that means there are shear forces which are acting on it and this will make the fracture unstable so the powell's as it is increasing from 30 to 70 degrees so, Powell's is 30, 50, 70, right? So, 70 is unstable. The inference which we draw from the Powell's is it is unstable. More vertical the fracture, more unstable it is. So, 
if it is more unstable there are more chances of a vascular necrosis that is the inference we draw from your powels and next is your gardens classification based upon the trabeculae based upon the trabeculae gardens is into four types type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 1 is your valgus impacted fracture right it is undisplaced undisplaced here the patient can happily walk right patient can walk right next is it is complete fracture here this is incomplete so first is incomplete just a valgus impacted fracture second is complete fracture but it is undisplaced third is displaced where this femoral head goes into varus and fourth is again a complete fracture and complete displacement is noted so this is based upon the trabeculae of the bone pattern in type 1 you see the trabeculae are continuous and what are these trabeculae so if you think this is your femur head this is your neck right and then this is your acetabulum so there are trabeculae here So, there are so there's a trabecular present over the femoral head and the neck and then so these are the trabeculae which are present over the femoral head and then neck and then the acetabulum. So, all these trabeculae are in continuity in case of 1 and 2. In 3, they get disrupted. In 4, the femoral head and neck is disrupted, but the head and acetabulum are in continuity. So, this is the garden's classification of IC fracture. So, here it is usually, I think it is the valgus impacted fracture. This is a patient of age some uh, uh, 45 years something, uh, 45 years and have come walking. She was walking on this fracture. So, so, treatment of this particular fracture would be? So, treatment of IC. So, IC is nothing but your intracapsular fracture. That means inside the capsule. That means flexion, abduction, external rotation is your attitude of the limb. But it is not so profound as an intertrochantic fracture. There will be shortening but not so profound as in IT fracture because the capsule which is present will hinder this external rotation to happen completely and shortening to happen completely. Right? And then the non-union is the complication. Right? And the treatment depends upon the age. If the patient's age is less than 60 years you can try for osteosynthesis so what is this osteosynthesis you are promoting the bone healing right bone healing the implant used are cc screws so the implant used here are cc screws if you see this was recently done this surgery is recently done so we have placed the cc screws along the fracture line right so these are three cc screws which we are placed two are anteriorly and one is in the posterior part right so this is the cc screw so this is the osteosynthesis which that means you are promoting the bone healing bone healing and this if you see observe the cancellus this is called the uh, cannulated cc means cannulated cancellus screws so what is this cancellus screws and cortical screws they are two important things but here the cancellus screws if you see the threaded portion is at the distal part of the screw so this is the proximal part which is like a tube and the distal part and here is the fracture so you have to be careful that this threaded part should should cross the fracture hence because this is more in diameter this is less in diameter as you tighten 
as you tighten this this will cause compression of the fracture so now this this threaded portion gets engaged into the femoral head like this and as you tighten will bring this femoral head towards the uh, 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 neck part and then as you tighten this gets compressed so this compression will cause healing of the bone right so this is osteosynthesis by cc screws so the answer here would be osteosynthesis by cc screws so when are you doing this hemi orthoplasty and thr what is hemi orthoplasty as the name itself suggests hemi orthoplasty as the name itself suggests hemi is nothing but half arthro means joint plasty is replacement so half joint is replaced so what is that half joint so it is your femoral head which is replaced by this prosthesis so these two are prosthesis so what is the post prosthesis the implant which is used to replace the anatomical part to replace the anatomical part is called your prosthesis anatomical part is called the prosthesis there are two types of prosthesis so one is your unipolar prosthesis and the second one is your bipolar prosthesis right so in why it is called unipolar and why it is called bipolar so here if you see this head so this is the acetabulum and you will place this particular prosthesis into the head right you place this particular prosthesis into the femoral neck so you will prepare the canal and when you will place this prosthesis into the shaft of the femur and then this whatever the head is there it sits into the acetabulum so there is only one round that is one femoral head type and that sits into the acetabulum that is unipolar but here if you carefully observe there is one circle inside over this there is one more circle right and then comes the acetabulum so there are two circles the movement is between this and this and this and this that is why it is called bipolar dual movements occurring so this is unipolar and bipolar so you, if you identify this processes it is your moore's prosthesis this is your bipolar prosthesis right so now one more thing you have to learn is your total hip replacement what is total hip replacement where the entire joint so if before it was hemiarthroplasty so only half of the joint is replaced now it is total hip replacement total hip replacement is both the articulating surfaces that is the acetabulum and the femoral head are replaced so this is your acetabular component this is your acetabular component and then this is your femoral head component these are called components and this is your stem and this is your poly something like cartilage between the two uh, articulating surfaces so this this complete system is placed here this is called total hip replacement it is done for individuals who are very active and it is done for individuals where the acetabulum is degenerated so instead of doing hemiarthroplasty if there are changes of arthritis in acetabulum you can directly take the patient to thr so now this is indication the thr indication is the acetabulum is degenerative in case of fracture neck of femur you can directly treat the patient with total hip replacement or a particular individual who is very active and more than 65 years of age you can directly treat with total hip replacement so that are the indications for total hip replacement right so next that is for ic fractures so here let us complete what is it fracture just for completion sake right this is intertrochanteric fracture right so the treatment of ic fracture would be it is different from ic it is proximal femoral nailing that is pfn proximal femoral nailing that is pfn is the treatment for it whereas for ic there are various option if the patient is less than 60 years you can still try for osteosynthesis if it is more than 60 years there are two option that is hemiarthroplasty and total hip replacement you can discuss with the patient and then take the decision next question next question please 
Read the following X-ray and identify the related complication of this fracture. This is a recent PYQ that is previous year question. So here if you see what is the fracture? So always in pediatrics the rule is you have to compare it with the normal side, right? You have to always take the normal X-ray and then you can comment on your comment on your pathological X-ray. So if you see here you can see there is a fracture of your lateral condyle. So lateral condyle is fracture. Whenever there is a fracture of lateral condyle it will result in a complication called so here let us learn in detail about the injuries around elbow right so here there are two important things so one is your supracondylar fracture somebody has asked about the supracondylar fracture so you can hear it out now then there is lateral condylar fracture right so supracondylar is nothing but it is most common actually it is most common and it is the it's somewhat like the distal femur so above the condyles is supracondylar fracture it is the most common fracture usually seen in four to eight years of age usually seen in those ages and it is of two types extension type and flexion type and the most important thing is it will have some damage to brachial artery because of the spike which is present anteriorly and it will damage your median nerve specifically your anterior interosseous nerve and it will result in malunion that is cubitus varus cubitus varus right in case of lateral condyle lateral condyle this is intraarticular intraarticular so here this is extraarticular so lateral condylar is what it is intraarticular and it is uh, it, it it is mostly prone for non union non union and in case of lateral condyle fractures and non union there is one more important terminology which you have to remember is your tardy ulnar nerve palsy Tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So, what is this tardy? Tardy means it is slow. What is ulnar nerve? Which is present on the medial aspect. So, when the, whenever there is lateral condyle fracture, if the fracture is not treated properly and it is left out like that, the medial condyle will grow, the lateral condyle will be present like that, resulting in your cubitus valgus deformity. And then this will cause the stretch on the ulnar nerve stretch on the ulnar nerve and hence this is called a slow palsy called tardy ulnar nerve palsy so this is your supracondylar and the lateral condyle so having understood this the answer is non-union with ulnar nerve palsy so non-union is where the bone the union does not happen if you don't treat the patients so here in supracondylar you can still do conservative treatment but in lateral condylar you have to reduce because it is intraarticular fracture you have to reduce the fracture and then prevent this cubitus valgus deformity so what is this varus and valgus it is the carrying angle of the elbow carrying angle of the elbow it is usually somewhere around 10 to 15 degrees so if there is excessive so, if the angle is reduced, it is cubitus varus. If it is increased, it is cubitus valgus. So, that is cubitus varus and valgus, right? And in val <coughs> cubitus varus, you can see this gun stock deformity. This is called your gun stock deformity, right? Cubitus varus. So, that is the fractures or injuries around the elbow right distal fragment so this is the uh, last but one question so let's complete it so a patient of age 12 years presented with knock knees on investigation found to have low vitamin d levels so very important and low phosphate levels calcium levels are normal 
wrist X-ray was ordered. The following are the radiological features of such a condition except. So, having said that low vitamin D levels, that is nothing but your rickets, right? In rickets, what is the defect? So, let's understand few various metabolic disorders. Metabolic disorders. So, first and foremost is your rickets, right? In rickets, what will happen? The osteoid formation is normal. Hence, your calcium phosphorus is normal. But it is defective mineralization. So, whatever the mineralization should occur over it is not happening. Defective mineralization. To that context, the bone is formed by organic and inorganic components. Inorganic is nothing but your calcium hydroxyapatite. So, this calcium is laid over this bone. That is the osteoid. Osteoid is nothing but whichever is not mineralized. So, non-mineralized bone is called osteoid. So, if you take bone, it has two components. Organic and inorganic right organic is consist of your collagen plus your osteocalcin which we have discussed and some other proteins inorganic is your calcium hydroxy appetite so calcium phosphorus magnesium and all so here the organic is formed so the bone osteoid is laid but it should be mineralized for it to be strong so it is defective mineralization seen in rickets hence the hence the pathology so what is the pathology the bones are weak whenever the bones are weak because of the forces they get deformed so various deformities are seen in rickets which mostly seen in your wrist joint so what will happen in case of uh, remineralization? So, first, it, near the physis, near the growth plate, if you see this is the growth plate, there are various stages and now the, oste the, now the uh, immature bone will become mature here as it reaches your diaphysis. Sorry, sorry, it will become mineralized. So, here, uh, if this is your bone, this is your epiphysis and this is your growth plate, right? So, this is your growth plate. So, as the bone forms, so it will increase the length here. So, now the new bone is forming and mixing up with your metaphysis. So, near the metaphysis area, so epi and metaphysis area is the growth plate where you see all the abnormalities. Where you see all the abnormalities, right? So, that is the cupping, the fraying and the splaying and the widening. And there will be delay in presence of epiphysis. Right. So, these are some of the important uh, conditions which are seen in case of wrist, wrist joint. So, there will be delayed appearance of your epiphysis and then there will be cupping. Cupping is nothing but cup-like deformity which is formed because of accumulation of the osteoid or uh, cartilage cells. Right. And then there will be spraying. Spray, flaying or spraying is widening of this uh, ends of the epiphysis. So, if you can see this x-ray here. So, this is your cupping, cup like thing, this is the cupping and widening of the growth plates and then you see the fraying. So, fraying of the physial margin, so important the cartilage cells which are present, they spread around, so that is the fraying of the margin. So, this is the x-ray of a person with rickets, but if you supplement this person with vitamin D, there will be enormous changes and all these radiological features will disappear. The treatment is so good with vitamin D and calcium immediately after the patient is responding you can see with your x-ray. Similar condition is curvy where there will be a defective collagen. Where there will be a defective collagen because of loss of vitamin C. This vitamin C is related to cross linking of this collagen. So, whenever there is absence of vitamin C, this collagen is weak. Here the collagen is weak. Here the mineralization is weak, right? So, there, there are the symptoms. So, here because of the collagen is weak, the osteoid itself is weak. So, there will be ring, Wimbergen sign or Pelkin spur. So, this is Wim Pelkin spur which is just a, uh, a extension on the 
metaphysis region and the epiphysis is surrounded by a single ring like structure called synovimbergen and there will be a white line of frankel so there will be uh, uh, this association that there will be a di differentiation between metaphysis and epiphysis it is white line of franklin and subperiosteal hematoma because the periosteum is very loosely attached then this will uh, move away and result in formation of various hemorrhages so periosteal hemorrhages would be present because the collateral because of the uh, decrease in vitamin c even the capillaries the ligaments are also lax and weak in case of scurvy so scurvy you have to remember the white line of frankel the wimberger sign and then your pelkan spur right and in case of rickets you have to remember the cupping the fraying the splaying and delayed appearance of the epiphysis so the answer here is early appearance of epiphysis right so there will be delayed appearance so there will be widening cupping and splaying but the epiphysis which has to be appeared will be delayed so that is rickets in rickets the calcium is usually normal the phosphorus could be low but there will be a decrease in vitamin d and similar conditions of uh, vitamin d low in adults is called osteomalacia right so it is osteomalacia osteomalacia is also soft bones which are seen in case of uh, adults right so last question for the day so this is the last question for the day let's wind up the session now so a maid is playing with a child by spinning him while holding his hands a few hours later the child starts crying does not use his arm and does not let anybody touch him what is the possible diagnosis so this is one of the easiest straightforward question in orthopedics and uh, you should never leave such a question and you should never waste time so one liner it is like a one liner so whenever you see a child is spinning by holding his hands that means there is no uh, support to your elbow so only by hands the uh, weight is been bared so this will result in a condition called pulled elbow that is if you see this is your radial head there is one ligament called your annular ligament annular ligament so this annular ligament is present around the radial head and slip of this annular ligament from the radial head will result in a condition called pulled elbow so this is very much an emergency and you if a simple maneuver will reduce and the patient will be pain free so this is pulled elbow right so that completes the session and uh, tomorrow it is by dr jazir so he will take dermatology and the important point here is there is a grand test which has been conducted tomorrow that is at uh, 10 o'clock am and the link is given below in that description box or link is present in the bio so please do attend the grand test and it is very 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 important to write the test and uh, you have to self analyze yourself so if, what are your weak areas what are your strong areas and based upon this test you can improve yourself okay there is no harm even if you are not prepared even if you are unprepared please do attend the test so there are conducting they are conducting on some 19 23rd and 26th uh, so this is 19 23rd and 26th all these uh, grand test sessions are there and uh, make yourself available for the uh, dermatology class also tomorrow which starts at 6 30 pm and thank you so much for your patient listening for your comments and uh, uh, it was a very great session thank you